and Michael Remus. Hey, what's going on, everyone? Happy Bomber Game Day, and welcome to Winnipeg Sports Talk Daily. Huss and Remo with you for the next couple hours. Lots to discuss as the Bombers look to uh, stay on top of the West Division in the Canadian Football League tonight, heading to Edmonton, where the home team has not won at Commonwealth Stadium since before they were named the Elks, and uh, since the Bombers won their Grey Cup in 2019. It's incredible that it's been that long. 21 straight home losses, a North American sports record, and the Bombers are looking to make that 22 tonight. Darren Bombing of Bonfire Sports is going to jump on later on in the program to set this one up tonight, as well as talk about the other games this week in the Canadian Football League. We will also... Be diving into a little more Jets off-season talk. And I'm going to have to get to this Phil Mickelson story coming up with Brandon Rewicki as well. Um, so Rue coming up in the middle of the program. And we're actually going to start it off. And I'm already bracing myself for the comments in the chat of what is this Penguins lunch. Um, because we are going to be talking a little bit more about this big Eric Carlson trade. How it came to be. What that does to the Pittsburgh Penguins. And were the Penguins ever really interested or active in kicking tires on Connor Hellebuck? And Josh Yowie from The Athletic in Pittsburgh is going to join us first up, coming up at uh, around the bottom of the hour. So lots to get to today. We'll hit the lines for Cool Bet a little later on. Still waiting to see what that number is on the Argo game, but apparently Chad Kelly is taking first team reps. So uh, we'll wait to see a little bit more about that. But I uh, just talked about that with Dustin Nielsen on the Lock Shop today. You can find that at the Lock Shop YouTube, at Lock Shop Bets, or Lock Shop uh, wherever you get your favorite podcasts. Um, so if you want a little bit more on tonight's game and uh, a betting angle to all of that, it's all up there in the Lock Shop. We will touch on that a little bit later on. Uh, just before we bring in Michael Remus, got to give a big thanks to the sponsors that make this show happen each and every day. Of course, our friends at Cool Bet and Princess Auto. Vita Health Fresh Market, Wallace & Wallace, uh, F Apparel, and Nick and & Nikki DQ, Boston Pizza, Royal Sports, Consolidated Supply, Manitoba Battery, Canadian Club, Modern Man, and Aquatech. Don't forget, get on over to Sports Talk, uh, Sports Talk WPG on Instagram, our Instagram site, and uh, you can enter very easily to win two tournament-long passes, or sorry, three tournament-long passes for the upcoming Manitoba Open. That is live through Friday's show, so get on over and do that. Uh, of course, our friends at Little Brown Jug, Aikens Lake, Breezy Bend, Assiniboia Downs, and the Winnipeg Gold Eyes, who uh, got another dub last night and have a big, big couple days coming up with the big Reggie Abercrombie celebration tomorrow. And, of course, the Bark at the Park on Saturday night. Um, let's get right to it and welcome in Michael Remus to the program. Remo, what's going on? Feeling good. Bomber game day. Feels like a Friday, but it's actually it's actually a Thursday here, huh? So we'll be able to talk about the game tomorrow. Looking forward to that. So uh, it's exciting. We'll see how the Bombers match up against Edmonton. It was a pretty tight game for uh, the first half last time. And <laughs> we're all wondering, uh, will Edmonton the streak continue i think it's longer than you know their home losing streaks is it equaled uh undertaker's wrestlemania win streak um oh, i'm trying to think well that's a good question i think brock lesnar beat undertaker after it was 21. 21 so elks he are was 22. the one in 21 and one. Oh my god the elks what are they at 22 now well should be t 22 after tonight. Sorry, they're 21, so it's equal to Undertaker's win streak. Wow. The uh, in the the reverse Undertaker. Well, it's feel <laughs> it felt like there's been an Undertaker around that team all year long because yes. they have been on life support and 
Again, we've talked about this before, but I mean, the uh, salary cap for coaching and management, I think, has really put the Elks organization in a bind. <clears throat> Chris Jones has changed the OC. And now the only other thing they had to do was change quarterbacks. And Trey Ford gets the start tonight, Reem. And this was a guy that was a first-round pick, had played at times last season for Chris Jones, obviously fell way out of favor with a poor training camp and was sort of mired at third on the depth chart. But when you go through the first eight games of the year, winning zero, changes will be made. And uh, the young Canadian's going to get a chance to start tonight. But... Uh, Tough spot for him coming up against a bomber defense that was rolling on all cylinders, stuffing the Lions in a locker a week ago here at IG Field. Yeah, oh, what a game that was. And, yeah, for Edmonton, I mean, what? What's the worst case? They lose again? Well, you're probably going to lose with Taylor Cornelius and uh, go with the unknown. Uh, well, that is Trey Ford. We'll see how it goes. I know a lot of people in chat, some people, not a lot. There's some people in our YouTube chat very nervous. But a running QB, we mentioned this yesterday. We saw what Dustin Crum did, uh, you know, in the loss to Auto. We saw what Chad Kelly did in the Grey Cup. Although he is, you know, what, making his first start. Um, we know he's athletic, but can he throw? And can the Bombers uh, bring pressure and get to him to make sure, you know, to make sure that he doesn't have a lot of time back there? So uh, I'm interested to see if this changes Edmonton's fortune. Uh, and, you know, it is nice to see Canadian QBs, but uh, I think he's quite a different QB uh, than Nathan Rourke, the other, you know, who made headlines. You know, we had heard for so long, can can there be a good Canadian QB in the league? And he was awesome, but I'll have to see what Trey Ford does uh, tonight against the Bombers. Yeah, well, he's got his work cut out for him um, uh, going up against the Bombers. And I don't think Gina Lewis is going to be in the lineup, which probably makes his job that much harder. That being said, on the other side of things, the Winnipeg Blue Bombers, um, you know, are at full strength. I, I I cannot remember a time when the lineup was the same from game to game. I mean, just in the nature of professional football with guys getting hurt, guys getting nicked up, coaches wanting to make a change here or there. Um, obviously, the Bombers got out of last uh, week's game and big win against BC healthy. Um, and when you play the way the team did last week, um, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. And uh, Mike O'Shea is going to run out that same group that put the 50-burger up on BC tonight in Edmonton as uh, the Bombers look to get to 7-2. Uh, and two. Um, You know, we'll get to Kenny Lawler in a minute. But just before we do that, I do not want to gloss over this or forget. Um, Remo, a big... Uh, listen, obviously it was disappointing end to the season for the Sea Bears last weekend at Canada Life Center, losing to Edmonton for the second time in a week and being bounced from the CEBL playoffs. But last night, the awards were announced for the league and um, all the hardware for individual awards is coming here to Winnipeg. Absolutely uh, incredible seeing them clean up on the hardware. We had heard the chance for MVP. And he got it. Teddy Allen, uh, named most valuable player, uh, sixth man of the year, Jelani Watson Gale. Uh, he gets that award. And Simon Hildebrandt, uh, U Sports player of the year. And also, I saw Mike Taylor was named coach of the year. And uh, Teddy Allen named all CEBL first team. And EJ, uh, all CEBL second team. So. Uh, shout out to the Sea Bears again, bringing in the hardware. What a season it was, and uh, it's unfortunate they're not advancing in the playoffs. As you know, it was a championship weekend coming up, but it uh, doesn't mean it wasn't a fantastic inaugural season. Yeah, exactly. Teddy Buckets was the man all season long, MVP of the league, very much deserved. Um, Jelani Watson Gale, who joined us on the show last week, what a pleasure he was to have on. Um, he was so much fun to watch. Never started, uh, I believe, led the team in scoring in a couple games. I mean, was an absolute, um, I mean, he would just come in and the, the energy that he added to the lineup when he came in was palpable. And, you know, Simon Hildebrand, what can you say about him? I, I was excited for the Bison star to get the opportunity to play with the Seabears this summer. Never imagined that he would play as much as he did and have the role that he did. And he sort of spoke to us about that on Winnipeg Sports Talk a few weeks ago, Reem. 
Um, and you just wonder what a summer like this is going to do for Hildebrand, who enters his second year for our pal Kirby Shep over at the U of M with so much more experience playing against a, a very high caliber of player, what that does going forward. But as I say, it, it is about team, and unfortunately the team fell short of their goals. But the Sea Bears organizationally deserve an award probably, and a lot of individuals deserve them, and they got them last night when the uh, CBL handed out their hardware. Yeah, I got the email like uh, 11 p.m. I sent out the awards. I don't know what kind of ceremony uh, it was on, but I was excited to see uh, see the Sea Bears um, again, just getting all the awards. And uh, what are they going to do next year uh, for a follow up of the Sea Bears? Uh, I'm curious if they can uh, continue the momentum. It was so great; people were excited, and I think a lot of people were talking about it. A lot of uh, people may not be. Basketball fans enjoying the entertainment uh, provided, you know, uh, at the game, uh, whether it's on the court or you know other you know other activities they have uh, at the arena. But uh, fantastic first season. So again, shout out to uh, the Sea Bears. Uh, maybe the story of the summer, Hus, for Winnipeg sports. Yeah, I mean, I would say it was certainly. Uh, I mean, probably, certainly for these last couple months. I yeah. Mean, well, you know, since the Bombers like, are always. A huge story in town, and I mean, the, it's not like the Bombers have been hurting at the gate. I mean, they continue nope. to put together some, uh, you know, great crowds, great performances, and you know, have championship aspirations yeah. again. But when you consider that basketball was, I mean, we haven't had a team in a long time, um, and the way that it was embraced, I mean, to me, the number one story was the fan support and and everything that that team was able to accomplish in the stands mm -hmm. for the first year. Uh, but also, I mean, what that means for the CEBL. I mean, you have to think that teams around the league and prospective owners are looking at what happened in Winnipeg with the product they were able to put on, taking advantage of playing in a major league venue like a Canada Life Centre as opposed to some of the smaller venues and what that was able to do. And, you know, I know you talked to Mike Morreale last week. It has been a magical season for the Sea Bears in particular. Um, and I think they've really raised the raised the expectations and the level of the CEBL in a lot of ways. Um, certainly when it comes to putting asses in seats and all those record crowds that we saw at Canada Life Center. Yeah, I think so. I think it makes you uh, wonder what's possible for, for a Canadian league. And I like how they, you know, keeping it short here in the summer. It's been a nice break, um, you know, with uh, what? With no, no hockey and, you know, the Bombers are, are doing their thing. So uh, I've enjoyed uh, I've enjoyed the Sea Bears and again congratulations and looking forward to seeing you know what's next for them next season. You're rocking the Sea Bears hoodie today, by the way. I am wearing the Sea Bears hoodie. Normally I would rock bomber stuff on game day, but I just figured this was probably the last time we'll really be talking about the Sea Bears and particularly the players made those that made all those contributions to uh, the great summer of hoops here in the city. So yes, Sea Bears for Teddy Allen, Teddy Buckets. Jelani Watson, Gale, Simon Hildebrand, Mike Taylor, congratulations to them all. And um, I mean, I know you get sort of connected to players, and we're going to see what the turnover is like. Uh, you know, when you talk about sports at this level, um, yeah, I'm not sure there's a lot of continuity within the roster year after year. Certainly, I think some of the local guys will still be key parts of it. Hopefully, Chad Posthumus and Simon Hildebrand and. Sean Moranen from the U of W, who was on the bench, but part of the club. I mean, whether they get a chance. But we'll see whether a guy like Jelani or Teddy Buckets are back next season. That being said, it was a uh, it was a great, great run, great year, and a heck of a lot of fun. Um, quickly to baseball before we get to Kenny Lawler. Um, nice win for the Fish last night. It took a little longer than the... Uh, that game on Tuesday night I went to, like, was barely over two hours. Um, you know, it, it's so funny what this pitch clock has done to baseball and people wanted shorter games. Well, they're certainly getting them right now. Um, but there was a little bit more action last night as the fish won eight to four last night to win the first two games of their series against Lincoln. Of course, tomorrow's a big day. I'll be popping out for a while during the show to uh, help MC along with Brody Jackson and Ace Burpee little celebration for Reggie Abercrombie with the Gold Eyes organization at their annual luncheon before his jersey's retired tomorrow night. But it was funny when I was thinking about this at the game, just how fast that it was blowing by when the pitching was on. 
Exact same thing in this Blue Jays series against Cleveland. I had to laugh. Ke Keegan Matheson said the Jays' last three results, a 3-1 win, a 1-0 loss, and a 1-0 win. And the Blue Jays advance from the group stage and are looking forward to their quarterfinal. I mean, they've basically been having World Cup scores lately, and last night was no different. Brilliant performance by Kevin Gosman, and they needed him to be that good because... It ended up being just a one-run game. God, they could use Bo Bichette back in the lineup. You see the difference that the loss of his bat means. But tell you what, that Blue Jay pitching staff, they now have four starters in the top 17 of ERA of the league. And that doesn't include Hyunjin Ryu, who had that great start earlier this week. And I know Manoa's going tonight. Still a bit of a question mark. But the way the Blue Jays' arms are going right now, I think we all know that there's a lot more to get from the Blue Jay bats. And I have to admit, I'm kind of feeling as bullish on the Jays right now as I have for most of the season. Yeah, Blue Jays in action uh, right now. Afternoon game here in Cleveland. Huss losing 2-1. Uh, Alec Manoa is pitching pretty well. Four innings, six strikeouts so far. Uh, but they're waiting for Bo Bichette uh, to come back. It's supposed to be, I think, they're hoping for Friday. We'll see. And we'll see what happens, uh, what happens with that. But I think the story of the Blue Jays season, you're right. The pitching been very good. It's been the hitting. I think overall their hitting has been like you look at the overall numbers, good. But uh, running and runners in scoring position been a problem for them like the last couple of years. I don't know, like what you do for that. What do they need more of the clutch gene, Huss? But it just. <laughs> When guys get on base, they haven't been able to uh, to put them in. Well, last night, I mean, not to not to talk about bad beats when it comes to uh, wagers over at Cool Bet, but I had the Jays on the run line, and it's the top of the eighth. They're up one nothing, bases loaded, no out, and uh, Danny Jansen does a weak pop that doesn't score, and next thing you know, they hit into a double play, and it's down to another one run game into the ninth inning. But they got it done. As I said, they're finishing up this series, looking to try to make it three of four against the Guardians in Cleveland at the Jake. And we'll keep an eye on that game throughout the afternoon. But, Remo, um, I know we're going to go to Pittsburgh and talk to uh, Josh Yoey in 10 minutes or so. But let's get back to this game tonight. And in, in some ways, it is a little bit of a, uh, well, it's homecoming, I guess. I mean, Kenny Lawler did move his family to Edmonton and was there, but seemingly did want to come back to Winnipeg. He was replaced by Gino Lewis, who's been limited to practice for Edmonton. And frankly, I don't know whether it really matters who's catching the passes, considering where their quarterback play has been. But, I mean, to me, there's been a few big differences of what we've seen from the Bombers lately. Um, but the impact of Kenny Lawler felt both for Zach Caleros targeting 89, as well as the space he seems to open up for the likes of Dalton Schoen and the other Blue Bomber receivers as well. Yeah, Dalton Schoen with the two touchdowns uh, last game. Uh, Kenny Lawler, he's played two games, has 293 yards on 14 catches, 17 targets. Uh, got a big touchdown. I mean, he goes, he can stretch the field. He can make contested catches. Uh, he's got a lot of, you know, but he's very, you know, you beat double coverage. It's incredible um, the skill that this guy has and how he's changed uh, the look of the Bombers. Stevens really give Bombers offense really give us, gives them an alpha dog that they can just uh, target all the time. And uh, he, look, he said he's going to get, uh, what, 2,000 yards. And you know, even after missing all this time, I mean, if he keeps having 150 yards a game, maybe he can get there. We'll have to wait and see. But. Uh, big big revenge game tonight for Kenny Law, right? Yeah. I, um, <laughs> listen, I think if anything, it's going to be, I mean, Kenny said he's got pretty lofty goals for his own personal statistics. Uh, let's just say it's a bit of a tease. If you check out Cool Bet's uh, play of the day later on that I'll be putting out, I think there's a high probability we're just going to hammer the Kenny Lawler over 74 and a half yards for tonight's game. Um, but we'll make that final decision when we record it a little bit later on today. Let's hear from uh, Kenny Lawler. And Kenny Lawler was a guy that played with Trey Ford, who's now getting an opportunity once again to get behind center and lead the Elks offense. 
um, and lead them to a win or the win that has been so elusive for this club in this season and in previous seasons at home. Lawler talked a little bit about uh, Trey Ford, who gets the start for Edmonton tonight. Uh, Trey Ford, he's a, he's a good player. Um, he relies a lot on his uh, physical gifts, um, has, a, has a lot of potential. Uh, to be a, a, a good, good, great quarterback in this league. So um, he just has to, you know, has to put the work in, grow mentally, uh, learn reads, and uh, man, yeah, that'll give him a great opportunity to be, you know, a good quarterback in this league. Well, uh, more learning, and uh, maybe he can learn some hard lessons tonight against that Bomber defense that completely suffocated BC last week. Uh, must be funny for Kenny, or not funny, but... Um, well, he's probably feeling pretty good about his decision to come to Winnipeg considering what's happened to Edmonton. Uh, Lawler talked a little bit about this winless campaign for the Elks uh, where there's still Ofer in the win column. Oh, man, it's, it, you know, it's, um, it's, I really wouldn't really know, man. I'm not in that uh, organization anymore. And, um, yeah, I wouldn't, you know, it's not, it hasn't been something that has crossed, me, you know, my mind. Um, I know the guys in that locker room. I feel for them. I know that they go to practice every day and compete and work. And, you know, they just haven't won a, won a game. When we, I was there, we didn't win a home game. So, you know, it was, just, it was just an unfortunate situation. Yeah, Kenny Lawler, the Bombers, talking about his old team at the Edmonton Elks. Now, uh, I think Mike O'Shea would love to see this team look exactly as they did last week in that monster game against B.C., not always the easiest thing to do that against a team that hasn't won and you come in as a massive favorite. But um, Kenny talked a little bit more about just trying to keep that same mindset that they did against the Lions, even though they're playing the lowly Elks tonight. How do you keep it? You know, it's just a part of uh, me. It's one of my routine to remember to carry the same mindset. Um, I believe we have like-minded guys in the locker room, so I know that they carry that mindset with them. Um, you know, when you want to be a, a great player, a great teammate, um, those is the you know that's the little things that you have to have to continue to remind yourself. Um, especially you know when you're facing one of the better teams in the league, and now that you're facing you know a not too good opponent uh, this year, uh, they, they seem to be struggling. And um, you could simply just you know say like, oh look, yeah, this game's going to be a win or whatever. Or you know you could say if you want to be a great player, you could say you know. It doesn't matter what their record is. We still have to go because we know as the Winnipeg Blue Bombers, we're going to get everybody's best. We've seen that, and, you know, we, we don't take anything lightly. We don't take anything for granted. So, you know, we have to continue, continue to remind ourselves, you know, that this is the mindset, this is the caliber that we play up to. And, um, you know, if, um, you know, if guys forget, you know, you have guys to the right and to the left of you to be able to remind you of that. There's Kenny Lawler, the Bombers, a little bit more from Bomber uh, receiver Lawler and Coach O'Shea. Uh, I did joke on the show yesterday what a pregame chat might be like between Geno Lewis and Kenny Lawler. Geno took the bag that was left by Kenny in Edmonton, became, I believe, the highest receiver in the league, and obviously it has been a miserable campaign for the Edmonton Elks. And uh, I, Kenny was just asked, I mean, knowing that team and you know many of the guys in the room, if the Elks players are thinking about this streak, both the losses this season and obviously the dubious home losing streak that dates back to 2019. Um, yeah, man, it's, it's probably in their mind. You know, it's, it's being talked about. And, you know, that's you know what they have to worry about in their organization. Being in this organization, you know, we just have to... Con- Worry about going one and zero each week. You know that's our that's what we say. You know we got to we got to focus on our uh, our four pillars that we play the game by, and um, you know that's um, that's going to lead to our success. We do that. We you know we do that. Um, I, I couldn't tell you what those guys are thinking. I'm pretty sure they're stressed out. You know, I could, I'm pretty sure they are. But you know um, that's a, that's really none of my concern, man. Um, my concern and uh, what I worry about is the guys in our in, uh, in our locker room and. Um, I know that we're just going to go out there and play a great game. Yeah, I guess Kenny's other concern is to continue putting up big numbers for the Winnipeg Blue Bombers. And here's one more. Kenny was asking if he's got another 200-yard game in him. Um, we'll just let we'll just we'll just let that be. We'll, let, we'll, just, we'll see. Um, how is that it goes possible? Tomorrow. I guess is what I'm going for. I don't want to put you on the spot. <laughs> 
Oh, man, for me, man, I'm just one of those guys that just goes with the flow of the game, man. I'm not, you know, looking to have a 200-yard game. I'm not looking to have, you know, a, a one-catch game. But, you know, I just go with the flow. I have a great quarterback that, you know, feeds me the ball when he feels like, you know, when it's necessary. He doesn't try to force anything. And, um, yeah, you know, if it's a 200-yard game tomorrow, it's a 200-yard game tomorrow. If it's a no-catch game, it's a no-catch game. As long as I'm able to, able to be on the field and be able to contribute to a win, that's really what matters. Yeah, well, I'll say this. I think it's a heck of a lot more likely to be closer to the 200-yard game than a no-catch game for Kenny Lawler tonight going up against the Edmonton Elks. Uh, let's hear a couple from uh, Coach O'Shea. Uh, and, and here's Mike on, uh, you know, going up against new Elks OC, Jarius Jackson, and, of course, a new quarterback in Trey Ford. Yeah, Jarius has been around a long time, so I don't think he's new. And Trey Ford's been there for a couple years and seen him play. Now he's getting another opportunity. I'm sure Jarius will have, um, you know, as much as they can give him, and and I'm sure he'll be given the plays that he can execute at a high level. And you're dealing with uh, one of the best athletes probably in the league, so um, those are all challenges. But it, it really comes down to defensively for us being disciplined and making sure that we're we're correct in, in our assignments. Um, more than anything, right? So you limit the escape lanes for him and cloud the pitchers for him. Yeah, the, the key bit there at the end, um, limiting the escape lanes for him. And the one thing the Bombers have been victimized at times on defense has been quarterbacks breaking big, big runs. We all remember what happened with uh, the crumb back in Ottawa. Um, and even in the game earlier uh, against uh, Edmonton here in Winnipeg, Taylor Cornelius did probably the most damage he did all night, you know, with the exception of that one long pass, running the football, and Trey Ford, probably the fastest quarterback in the league, so that is something the Bomber defense is going to have to uh, be very wary of when uh, things get going tonight in Commonwealth. One more from O'Shea, uh, and <laughs> I joked that if you ask me and Remus about the Edmonton game, what we'll remember the most is going head-to-head -head with the yard dog. Um, Mike O'Shea was a little more focused in on what was happening on the field. Very close game at halftime. Bombers sort of you know, blew it open in the fourth quarter. But here is O'Shea's takeaways from the first matchup earlier this month against the Edmonton Elks. Well, I don't know that we played our best first half, but you know, I think we've been guilty of that a couple times this year. So um, you, you got to start fast, you know, that's, but it's something that we've talked about a lot, right? So now it's just about for the players to discover what their mindset is that allows them to do it. Because obviously this last game we started fairly fast. So you'd like to you'd like to continue that. But in the end, really what's most important is is winning and whatever the game looks like. It's making sure we're on the right side of the scoreboard at the end. All right, there's Blue Bomber head coach Mike O'Shea. Hey Reem, just quickly you're a big hat guy. Any idea what that hat O'Shea was wearing? No, I saw it and I don't know. What hat that is. Uh, Anybody in chat? I thought it might have been like a Houston Rockets logo at the beginning, but then it... Uh... Yeah, I... You can't really see it from the front. I don't know what it is. I know Zach... Oh, here it is. H... A... O? A... I don't know what that it's is. It's a D on the right. Anyways, if you know in chat, if you have any thoughts on all of that, you can uh, you can let us know. We're gonna do some detective work on what hat Mike O'Shea was wearing in his pregame press conference <laughs> because uh, it is not a uh, not a bomber one. Um, listen, we're gonna get to more on tonight's game and as well as the week in the CFL with bombing later on in the show, and we will talk a little hockey talk and and this crazy Phil Mickelson gambling story. I I can't wait to hear what rowicki has got to say about that. We'll do that in a little later on, but the biggest hockey story. This week in the National Hockey League is has been this huge trade with Eric Carlson landing in Pittsburgh from San Jose. And uh, we're going to head out to Pittsburgh in a minute and talk more about that with Josh Yoey and find out if uh, the Penguins were ever seriously um, kicking tires on Jets goaltender Connor Hellebuck. Um, just before we do that, though, I mentioned this right off the bat, folks. Get on over to our Winnipeg Sports Talk Instagram page and enter to win tickets to the Manitoba Open, courtesy of our friends at Aquatech. All you need to do is uh, 
Just follow the very simple instructions. Give Aquatech a follow as well as Winnipeg Sports Talk. And you can uh, tag a couple friends that you'd want to take to the golf. Morgan Barron's going to be participating. So that is up right now at the Winnipeg Sports Talk uh, Instagram page. And of course, Aquatech has uh, lots going on right now. Limited install dates left. So visit Aquatech in store or online at aqua-tech.ca to learn about how they can make your in-ground or above-ground pool dreams a reality. And of course, the leaders in Renos with thousands of Renos is their foundation as well. More information on all of it is available at aqua-tech.ca. I'm going to give a big thanks to our friends at Modern Men Barbershop for their support of Winnipeg Sports Talk. Guys all around the city have been finding great cuts and service at Modern Man at one of eight conveniently located uh, locations around the city, including their newest um, locations on Pemina Highway and on Plessy Road. Um, obviously, they've got haircuts, but also do beard shaving, shaves, color services, and more. Book your look at modernmanbarber.com and follow them on Instagram at Modern Man Barber Shops. Another big weekend coming up. Got your batteries ready for whatever you're doing on the weekend. You're heading out in a boat, a sea do, an ATV, a, tra- a camper, maybe a lawn tractor. Uh, the bottom line is Manitoba Batteries got batteries for literally everything. And you'll be able to shop local, get the best price in town, and have the best buying experience anywhere as Donnie and his staff not only will give you the best price, but they'll also deliver it for free anywhere in Winnipeg inside the perimeter with any purchase of 60 bucks or more it's really that easy save time and money as opposed to the big box stores with the local battery experts manitoba battery find out more order online at manitobabattery.com give them a call or pop by and see them at 1026 logan avenue hey we got another great summer weekend coming up might be time to uh, pop by your beer vendor but when you're there check out the Canadian Club in Ginger Ale, Canada's favorite Canadian whiskey, now mixed in a great pre-mixed cocktail, available in 473 milliliter cans and in six packs. So even if the Liquor Commission isn't open, you should be able to find CC and Ginger at your favorite beer vendor. And whenever the LCs are open, the entire family of Canadian Club products available there. And of course, as well at IG Field as the official sponsor of the Winnipeg Blue Bombers. All right, Brandon Wiki coming up in a few minutes, but right now let's head to Pittsburgh and welcome in Josh Yowie from The Athletic on the Eric Carlson trade. All right, let's welcome in Josh Yowie from The Athletic to uh, get a little bit of more information from Pittsburgh on that massive Eric Carlson trade. Josh, what's up? It's great to have you back on the program. I'm not used to writing so much in August. This is supposed to be my off time, but it's it's been a little busy here in Pennsylvania. <laughs> You know, the Penguins have been fascinating all off season, really. I mean, and this in a lot of ways goes back to Kyle Dubas being hired as the president of hockey operations and now assigning himself as the general manager as well. Just quickly go back to that point. I mean, um, what was your take on the Penguins aggressive move to get Kyle Dubas and the power that he's been entrusted with to uh, kind of steer this ship in the final years of uh, the Crosby era? Well, you know, the Penguins did not know if Dubas was going to be available. I remember when Ron Hextall was fired and Brian Burke was fired, that was mid-April, you know, and then all of a sudden the Maple Leafs win a, win a playoff series, which they never do, right? It's like, whoa, maybe Dubas' job is safe. Maybe he wants to stay there. So the process kind of with the Penguins kept going on and on and on, and the reason it took so long was they were waiting to see if he would be available. He was always the guy they wanted. Uh, the Penguins' new owners, the Fenway Sports Group, um, they always had him pegged as the guy who just fit in with the way they looked at sports. They, they thought he had this incredible brain, and and they wanted to, to have him a part of the organization if it was possible in any way. And when it became possible, they didn't need much longer to make the decision. And uh, he has all the power. Um, you, know, you give somebody a seven-year contract, and you can be the GM and the president, whatever you want. It, it's pretty obvious who has the power in Pittsburgh right now. You know, I mean, you mentioned the Fenway group, and they obviously had eyes for Dubas. Uh, I, I, I am interested as what the reaction of um, maybe the most important guy in the room, 87, was to uh, Kyle Dubas coming on board. 
Oh, he's he's thrilled. I, I know, in fact, that they spoke in Pittsburgh a couple of days before Dubas was actually named uh, the president uh, of the team. And uh, I, you know, Sid, <laughs> I haven't had a chance to personally speak with him about Dubas just yet. But from everything I've been told, he, he's a big fan. And it doesn't surprise me. Um, I think Sid appreciates people who have great hockey minds. And I wouldn't say Sid's like a huge analytics guy, but he, he actually tells me he'll look at analytics of other teams before games, and he's curious about that kind of stuff. And, and hearing him talk about that makes makes me think of Kyle Dubas. And when we asked him, they say you're an analytics guy, Kyle, and he kind of bristles at that. He says, well, I take them into account, but I'm, I'm not just that. I'm also just a hockey junkie. And Sidney Crosby's a hockey junkie, too. He always says he watches 80 games a year that have nothing to do with Pittsburgh games. So I think they're going to work really well together. I, I have no doubt it's going to be a good relationship. Um, you know, he, at the draft, obviously, they got Riley Smith at a really low cost. They kind of started the facelift. But this Eric Carlson trade is um, is massive. And it's an incredibly creative deal. It involved three teams. Um I know you've been digging on this for a long time. How long did this trade take to pull off? And how much did it take from Kyle Dubas when it comes to, you know, maybe a big picture way of thinking to get Eric Carlson uh, in the Berg? These trade talks started in late June. And I have it on very good authority that the trade almost happened on July 1st, on the first day of free agency. Really close to happening. San Jose kind of balked, I think. And so they went back and forth and kept talking for five more weeks until it happened. And I, I can tell you this, uh, the Penguins had a lot of bad contracts, uh, contracts they wanted to rid themselves of. And I was told by somebody in the organization a few days ago, there were three contracts we really wanted to get rid of. That was kind of one of the priorities of the offseason. The top three, Mikel Granlund, Jeff Petrie, and Jan Ruda. And, and by God, those are the three Kyle Tubas managed to get rid of while bringing in Eric Carlson. Um, Kyle Dubas could run for mayor in Pittsburgh right now. He is wildly popular among the fan base. Um, it was one of those trades we always joke about. Let's trade all of our bad players for your good player. And, of course, those trades never, you know, never jive in reality, right? But, but this time it, it kind of did. And, and, yeah, they gave up a couple of draft picks. But everybody in Pittsburgh is thrilled. It was a really complex deal. Could not have worked without the Montreal Canadiens uh, joining the party. And I think they actually probably helped themselves just to get rid of the Hoffman contract, if nothing less. So certainly there was some benefit for the Habs. Um, but yeah, it took quite a while to orchestrate this deal. I, I know for a fact San Jose's GM, Mike Greer, wanted a lot more. He just didn't have the leverage. Not many teams were willing to take on Eric Carlson's contract. Um, San Jose is still paying, I think, $1.5 million of Carlson's deal, but the Penguins are going to give him $10 million a year. That's a lot. But when you unload all the salaries they just did, and when you consider Latang and Malkin are now playing for much cheaper rates than they used to, and Crosby, frankly, at $8.7 million is still underpaid, I think we can all agree, um, they figured it was worth the risk. Yeah, um, and, and listen, it's a new lease on life for Carlson, who comes to a team with, you know, with big expectations coming off a disappointing year. Um, they already have Chris Latang. Um why Eric Carlson, and how does he fit into this team? Hmm. Well, I, you know, it's funny. I actually ran into Mike Sullivan a few days ago. We were both at a in an event in Boston, and I didn't know he was going to be there. So I, told him, I said, Mike, I don't mean to bug you at this country club dinner, but do you have a minute? And we, he said, sure. And we went outside. We talked for half an hour. And I said, all right, what's what's the – I said, I know he's a great player. What What's the mindset here? What's the thinking and he said the thinking is either Chris Letang or Eric Carlson will be on the ice 80% of the time when we're playing next season. And that means we're going to have the puck a lot. And that means Sidney Crosby and Evgeny Malkin both will be out there with one of those two guys most of the time. And that was pretty much it. And I can tell you, Chris Letang is a great player, um, probably a Hall of Famer. Uh, Letang does not really run the power play as well as you might think. It's not his strength. I mean, he, he's a very gifted player, but he drives the Penguins coaching staff crazy sometimes with the refusal to shoot the puck, uh, just different habits on the power play. Eric Carlson's going to be running the power play. He, he's going to be the quarterback. Latang might still be on it, um, but th they want Carlson to run the power play. And 
They just want to be a dominant five-on-five offensive team. And when you look at Carlson historically, that's what makes him unique. Just the numbers he puts up at even strength are uncommon for even great defensemen. Um, so the Penguins, in, in their minds, this was their best avenue uh, to try and to make one final cup run. And when you've got a top four now with Latang and Carlson and a couple of really good defensive players in Ryan Graves and Marcus Pedersen, um, th- there are still holes in this lineup. But, boy, that top four is pretty imposing. Josh Joey from The Athletic in Pittsburgh joining us discussing the Eric Carlson trade and more of the Penguins offseason. Um, you know, the team does look significantly different. And, you know, credit to too much you mentioned, they got rid of some problematic contracts and probably have some more efficient money on the books. That being said, this team missed the playoffs last year. We all remember the face plant in the uh, final couple games of the season to, to shockingly have them out. Um, but I would imagine this is both with Carlson, but I'd say almost Dubas as well, a huge shot of energy to really put that season in the rearview mirror. It was a season unlike any other. If you had told me, <laughs> I, I go back to around Christmas. We have uh, Dom at The Athletic has this model we use, uh, giving a team a percent on its chance to make the playoffs. At that time, he had the Penguins at a 97% chance to make the playoffs. And from that point on, Crosby and Malkin did not miss a game. In fact, they both played 82 games. If you had told me the numbers say there's a 97% chance they're making the playoffs and Sid and Gino won't miss a game, boy, they're, they're in good shape. And the whole team imploded. I think Kristen Jari is probably the single biggest question mark. They just gave him a five-year deal. I don't know that they were comfortable in doing so. I just don't think that they thought there was a better goaltending option out there. They didn't want to sell the farm for Connor Hellebuck or John Gibson. Um, They thought it was the prudent way to go. He's a question mark. Uh, The bottom six was terrible last season. And as a result, they they had to rely so heavily on the big guys that really for the first time in all of my years covering him, Sidney Crosby looked tired at the end of the season. I've never seen him really look tired before. He's just, he had a great year and almost 100 points and he's always in marvelous condition, but you could see it. There were some games down the stretch. He did not look himself. And they were, you know, he's playing 24 minutes a night as a 35-year-old forward and all their responsibilities defensively because the bottom six not only couldn't score for the Penguins, they couldn't defend either. And it finally was just too much. And, And I should include this. And this is still a problem for the Penguins going forward. The Eastern Conference is just a bear. There are so many good teams in the East. Like, like how many really bad teams are there in the East? Philadelphia, maybe? Maybe one other? I don't know. But there are 12 teams that legitimately could make the playoffs this season. You you got teams like Ottawa and Buffalo. They're getting better. Um, So I think it was just a combination of an incredibly difficult conference. Uh, No depth at all on that team. No real goaltending in the second half. It, It was just too much. You mentioned the Jari contract. And, of course, we here in Winnipeg have been um inundated with trade rumors of Connor Hellebuck throughout the year, and Pittsburgh was one of those teams. Um, Do you have any idea as to how um, much they kick tires on Hellebuck and if uh, they were seriously into potentially get a game-changer like him into the net? I would guess Kyle Dubas spoke with the Jets. I'm sure he did. Um, You know how it is. These guys, they all talk with one another just to get a gauge. I mean, everybody knows – what a great goaltender Connor is. That's that's no secret. Um, I don't think there was any real substance to it. And, and you know, I, I bring up John Gibson's name, too, partially because John Gibson's from Pittsburgh. So for years, we always hear about the John. You always hear John's name because he's from here. Um, but I don't think they ever really engaged in trade talks. And I, I will say for Jari, he is a physically gifted goaltender. He really is. He, you watch him practice. You watch how big he is and how he moves. Like, you can see all the talent. And he's been to two All-Star games in four full seasons. So it's not like the guy stinks. Um, but he wasn't very good last season. He has sustained four different injuries, I believe, in the last 16 months. A couple of them pretty serious. And his all-time postseason record, I believe, is 2-6. and six. And he's had a couple of real meltdowns in the playoffs as well. So you just don't really know what you're getting from him. The Penguins are clearly taking a risk, giving him that kind of a deal. But from what, the way I've understood it, um, Kyle Dubas and Mike Sullivan looked at the market 
and they didn't really think there was a better goaltender on the free agency market than Jari, and they just didn't want to give up whatever it would take to get a Hellebuck or a Gibson, so this is the route they chose. Uh, I guess, uh, I mean, listen, all eyes will be on Eric Carlson. You know the big guys up front will be carrying the uh, the water for the club, but probably the most pressure on anyone is Jari to live up to that contract and be the guy, especially with DeSmith now on the way. There's no question. Uh, listen, the Penguins are going to score goals. I mean, we yeah. we know. Look at the names. As long as they're reasonably healthy, uh, offense should not be that much of a problem. Uh, that's how it's been for years for the Penguins, though. Goal prevention is often the issue. Um, yes, the spotlight on Jari is going to be brighter than ever. And it's not like the Penguins are building some great defensive team to try to insulate him. They, they just got Eric Carlson, for God's sake. He, he, he's not going to the Hall of Fame because of his defensive work. We all know that. Um, so it sounds like a lot of 6-5 games are in the Penguins' future, which is okay with me because, hey, that's fun. And honestly, you know this. Every market is different. And in Pittsburgh, listen, this is a great fan base. It's also a very spoiled one. For the last 35 years, you've had Mario Lemieux or Yarmer Yager or Sidney Crosby, Evgeny Malka. You know the names. Um, this is a, a city, a fan base that likes offense, that wants to see high-scoring hockey games. Um, so from that standpoint, yeah, it's been a great summer. Um, but the pressure is still on Tristan Jari um, to be a strong goaltender because, like I said, this conference is so good. I, I don't care how many goals you score, how talented you are, you still need to hold down, hold down the fort at the other end of the rink. And it, it's going to be fascinating. And and by the way, the NHL got something right with the schedule this season. Very first game of the season, Connor Bedard makes his debut for the Blackhawks in Pittsburgh against Sidney Crosby and Eric Carlson making his debut with the Penguins. Uh, can't wait for that one two months away. Oh, man, <laughs> that will be a hell of a heck of a way to uh, to begin the season. Um, Josh, folks, if you want more on um, the, this trade, the background to it, um, Josh and uh, the reporters at The Athletic have a great selection of articles. And your final one was, I guess, about the introduction of Eric Carlson. And I imagine the Pittsburgh organization is getting a very excited Norris Trophy winner to uh, uh, come into Pittsburgh to uh, try to move on from um, some real lean years in San Jose and uh, get back to winning. Yeah, very much so. You know, I've dealt with Eric a little bit over the years. The Penguins and Senators have played in the playoffs many times, in fact. Uh, series involving him in 2010, 13, and 17. So, yeah, I, I wouldn't say I know him, but I've dealt with him a few times. Very likable guy, very chatty. And uh, I, I certainly had the sense yesterday that he's kind of relieved this is all over and that he's very comfortable here. And why wouldn't he be? Um, this is a, a franchise that has always been based on star power uh, so much to, to the fact that, you know, for what, 20 years, the, the biggest star of them all was the primary owner of the hockey team. Uh, the stars always dictate things in Pittsburgh. Um, and Pittsburgh likes offense. Pittsburgh likes talent. And when you think of Eric Carlson, well, you, you think of all those things. So uh, we'll see how it goes. Uh, the Penguins are a really old team. There are still holes in this lineup. You never know what to expect. But we will all be watching uh, when the season starts. Uh, uh, there's no question the Penguins are really relevant again. And they felt a little stale last season. And I don't know what to expect from this team, but I don't suspect uh, they will feel stale. It's going to be fascinating to see. Josh, great catching up. Thanks so much. And enjoy August now that the, most of the heavy lifting's done for the offseason. My pleasure. Anytime. All right, great stuff with Josh Yoey. Uh, looking forward to having Brandon Rewicki on it and getting back to the Bombers a little later on with Darren Bombing on today's show. Um, hey, I've got to give a big thanks to our friends at Vita Health Fresh Market. If you are looking for great prices on natural and organic supplements, beauty products, and groceries, you need to get on down to one of six Vita Health Fresh Market stores or online at myvita.ca. When you order online, you can now choose same day local delivery. And uh, any orders placed by 11 a.m. and you'll get the order that day. And great deal right now, guys. If you sign up for their promotional emails, you'll receive an offer for 15% off your next online order at myvita.ca. Details are all on the website. And by the way, you'll also be able to check out Winnipeg's largest assortment of local products too. Got those great grass-fed bison and beef steaks for the uh, the grill. 
You can wash those down with some sober carpenter beer, Santa Cruz lemonade. Vita Health Fresh Market, empowering people to lead healthy lives. Six Winnipeg locations and online at myvita.ca. Well, our friends at Wallace & Wallace, of course, are the uh, leaders in fencing and overhead doors in town and are very busy this summer. Um, they're also, they've just finished up supplying all the fencing for the uh, World Fire and Police Games. And of course, Saturday's the big day at the ballpark, the bark in the park. And Wallace and Wallace is supplying the pedestrian fence for the dog registration pen for the bark in the park and are sponsoring the photo pet, bo uh, pet photo booth next to Craft Beer Corner. So check that out on Saturday. And of course, if you ever have needs for temporary fencing for weddings or residential for weddings, etc., or commercial, They've got those, and heck, if you need a dog run, they make those too. Find out more, 452-2700. Give them a buzz to find out more. Visit them at wallacefences.com and pop down to their showroom in Lawson Road or Keniston, and don't forget about the Bark in the Park on Saturday. Uh, fellas, how's your closet looking? Fall is just around the corner. If you need to up your menswear game heading into the new season, get on down to F Apparel. Custom suits beginning at 400 bucks, along with chinos, golf pants, custom shirts, both tucked and untucked styles, and an incredible selection of menswear accessories. In a wedding party, talk to the guys down at F about a 15% discount for everybody in the wedding party when you get your suits at F Apparel. 190 Smith Street downtown. Find out more online or make an appointment at F, that's E-P-H-Apparel.com. And another summer weekend coming up. You got to get down to one of the four Nick and Nicky DQs and get on these amazing summer blizzard flavors. They're ready for you at the DQ in Niverville, along with DQ Northgate, DQ Polar Park, and DQ St. Anne's. And while you're there, check out those great ice cream cakes. And heck, if you want a customized one, hit them up on Instagram at DQ Manitoba. Make it however you want it with whatever you want on it for a quick and easy pickup at any of the four Nick and Nikki DQs. All right, let's get Brandon Rewicki in here. Ru, what's going on? How are you? I'm doing pretty good. How are things over there? Uh, things are well. Looking forward to this Bomber game tonight. Uh, this one has the potential to be very, very ugly for the home side, but uh, that's certainly nothing new for uh, the folks in Edmonton. No, that, that sounds about on par. I mean, we look... We, we we've dealt with similar style seasons in in this city not not too long ago. So um, I I think I I think and I hope the bombers aren't going to take this one for granted. And I mean especially with I mean maybe one of the lone positives from the debacle in Ottawa is that the team uh, they're not going to be giving away any uh, any cheap ones anytime soon. So just go in, take care of business. The plan should be that we're all resting by the fourth quarter. So let's just make sure that we that, – that should that should be the main goal in this one is end this one after about 35 minutes. Yeah, guys, here's the game plan. Do what you did last week. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and do it to Edmonton as opposed to a very good BC, uh, BC Lions team. Hey, uh, we just had Josh Yoey on in Pittsburgh. And I'm going to bring this back to the Jets in a minute, but uh, – what did you think of the Carlson trade when you heard it? What was your first reaction in the middle of the long weekend when you saw that that thing was done and released on the Sunday of it? And Eric Carlson, albeit a ten million on the books as opposed to eleven and five, was now a member of the of the Penguins, your rivals. Yeah, yeah. My my initial thought was anywhere but anywhere but Pittsburgh, please. <laughs> like I and I've been. I mean, you know, I'm one of the one of the vice presidents of the Eric Carlson fan club. I mean, I, I just. He's just a wizard when he's out there on the ice. So I mean, you, you you take both those things together. It was a pretty it was a pretty tough uh, Sunday afternoon for me. But I mean, it makes all the sense in the world from from the Pittsburgh perspective. If anything, what it does is it it just it casts another light on how insanely dysfunctional and and short sighted and just chaotic the Ron Hextall tenure was in Pittsburgh. Because they, I mean, once the decision was made to to re-sign the, the the gang and to have the the three icons remain, it's like, okay, well, are we going to win a cup? Probably not, but we got to keep chasing one as long as they're under contract here. And that was at odds with what Ron Hextall wanted to do. So, I mean, it's it, it's what Pittsburgh should have probably been doing the past couple of years. Um, 
it's a reminder as well that that Kyle Dubas, you know, isn't afraid to to take the big swings and you know, for all his his faults as a GM, he does pretty damn well in the trade market. And I mean, to, I, I get Carlson makes ten plus whatever it is that that's going to be on the Penguins cap, but but for Pittsburgh to gain three million in cap space, not give up anything major asset wise other than a protected first round pick, and you get the Rainy Norris Trophy winner. I mean, it's to me, it's an A plus trade by Pittsburgh every single day of the week. I don't I don't think San Jose did poorly, but I think it might be a bit of a. Um, a bit of a tough wake-up call for Mike Greer there, not a rookie GM, but in his first year last year, that selling him at the deadline might have uh, might have gotten you quite the haul. Um, maybe you had to retain a little bit, but in terms of what came back from from San Jose's side of things, I'm not buying that the cap space itself is a major win, considering that you just traded the defenseman who had the best season, one of the best seasons we've seen in 20, 30 years. Well, yeah, they'll get cap space in a few years, but, I mean, they had to take Mike Hoffman, Yep. They took Granlund at five million. I mean, both of those guys right now are making more than Carlson's going to be making for Pittsburgh. I mean, what really stood out to me from what Josh had to say was the fact that at the beginning of this period of time, the Penguins identified three contracts that they wanted to rid themselves of. Jan Ruda, uh, Granlund, and um, Petrie. And Petrie, yeah. All three of them gone in this trade. I mean, like, like it takes some creativity, and obviously this one was being hammered out for a long time. I mean, Justin, it almost got done at, you know, around July 1st, but I think Mike Greer probably thought that, well, you know, maybe there's a, a better deal out there, and there just wasn't. And I think in a lot of ways, when you look at what San Jose is getting for this player, who, again, just won the Norris Trophy, um, it speaks to, you know, the market. Um, and maybe explains a little bit more as to why some other key players haven't been dealt. But with four years left, this was very different than a player with an expiring contract like a Lindholm, a Shifley, a, a Hellebuck. But I'll tell you what, um, Dubas comes out. I mean, I, I've sort of been skeptical at times about some of the moves that he's made, and we'll still see how the Tristan Jerry signing goes. I think that's the biggest question right now. But I'll tell you what, when you look at what left their team and what they got, hard not to think that they hit a home run on this one, despite the fact that for a team that is going to be needing picks going forward, they did give up a first and a second in a couple drafts. Yeah, I don't I don't know if they need picks though, Hus. Like it's they're, they're in a they're in a different situation. They're going to in a few years. Yeah, they, well, yeah. <laughs> and they didn't trade a 2029 20, first round pick. That that's that's the big win for Pittsburgh in this one. But they're they're just in a different like I mean Tampa Bay might be the only one that's in a similar boat, but not even necessarily them because the Penguins have won their cups. It's almost like this is just we just I, I think from a Penguins fan perspective, it's like we just want to enjoy entertaining hockey. And like, are are, are we going to win a cup? Is the Carlson trade going to help them win a Stanley Cup? I don't think so. Get some closer, but I think they're still so far behind what, four, five, six other teams? It's not going to help them bridge that gap. But at the very least, it does help shorten it, and it makes it a much more entertaining watch for the next three, four years of Crosby, Malik, and Latane's careers. And and I think that's a major win for, for, for everybody there in Pittsburgh. So well, I'll say this. I mean, I, I think there's two ways to look at this. One is in terms of the regular season, and the other is in terms of the playoffs. I think it makes them significantly better in the regular season. Well, let's not forget, this team threw up all over themselves in the final week of the season and missed the playoffs when, it was awesome, Josh yeah. pointed out, earlier earlier in the year, they had like a 97% chance of being in the, in the playoffs. So that was a huge failure. Carlson will get them more goals, will get them more points in the regular season. When you think about making you know a team that is going to be able to survive seven games against some of those badass teams in the East and really in the entire National Hockey League. I do have some skepticism as to, you know, how that works come playoff time against the elite of the National Hockey League, but I certainly think this sets Pittsburgh up for a big bounce back season after such a disappointing ca campaign last year. Well, it is interesting you mention that, and that's one of the things I, I love about, you know, Carlson and why I've been such a big fan is that he he carries some of those 
popular not misconceptions but popular tropes about offensive defensemen right like once it gets time to playoff time are they going to be able to help you and can they perform when when things get more physical more intense things like that he's without a doubt one of the best defenseman playoff performers of all time and i mean he had a legendary playoff run himself single-handedly carrying an Ottawa Senators team that had no real business being anywhere near the Stanley Cup final into, you know, I think it was overtime or double OT, something like that, when when the Penguins scored and, and beat them in game seven there. Like, he's I, he's a proven playoff performer. So I'm actually kind of scared if they get into the playoffs what the Penguins might be able to get done. Again, I, I just think they're they're too far back. Um, you know, it's it's um, unless they go Crosby, Malkin, go, you know, supernova and turn back the clock a decade. I just don't think there's enough there outside of that. Like you mentioned, the Jari uh, contract as well. When he's healthy, is he good enough? Let alone, can he be healthy by the time the playoffs come around? But Carlson in the postseason, as long as you've got, you know, not, 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 you don't need a Mark Mathop beside him, but as long as you have a steadying presence on the other side of him, I'll take my chances up against yeah, anybody. I, and, and, and listen, that is a great point. I mean, that is going to be, I mean, listen, when it comes to playing defense, um, Eric Carlson, Chris Letang, I mean, these guys are not, you know, at the top of the list. But again, I mean, it's up to management and the coaching staff to get them a partner that really supplements them and maybe gives them a little bit more um, more rope to go and, and, and do what they do best, and that's to get the puck and get it out of their end, which is the best way to play defense, not have yep. it in your own end. I will say this, though. I, I'm fascinated as to what Carlson looks like playing for a competitive team this year. Because I don't know if you remember that San Jose game where he got 100 here in Winnipeg. But he did a couple great things on a couple shifts. And, you know, was um, I think he scored both the goal. It was, they both he goals. scored like five was, seconds into the game, didn't he? It was very, very early. It was an ugly, ugly yeah. <laughs> um, bit of defending by the Winnipeg Jets. But there were a couple other moments. I mean, Morgan Barron blew around him on the side of the board. I mean, it basically looked like, you know, he wasn't even even trying to defend against him. And I mean, the bottom line is that whole San Jose season seemed to be around getting Eric Carlson points, points and having something to something to show for it. Moving conferences to that division, to the night in night out of the east. I mean, there is going to be much more of a challenge when it comes to holding up his own weight. But again, Said before, best way to do that is to keep the puck and be out of their yes. end. And I have a feeling Pittsburgh's going to have a leg up on most of their opponents this year doing yeah. exactly that. He's um, you're not going to confuse him for Rod Langway. Like uh, I'm never going <laughs> to try to make that argument. But I, I, I mean, the dude just needed some help and support last. Like I, I, I take a look at San Jose's roster right now, and it's a miracle that they didn't finish like beyond dead last. I, I, and this year, I mean, I, I really don't know if. I mean, Chicago's going to try, but to me, Chicago, San Jose are so far behind everybody else. Like that, that, that what he was able to do with the Sharks last year, I, I think, is just truly, truly tremendous. That they were like break even with them on the ice, and then like minus sixty in the goal department with them <laughs> off the ice there. But I, I'm intrigued to see what he does in a Mike Sullivan system, which always emphasizes quick puck movement from the back end and then trying to transition quickly. It, to me, seems to be like a dream come true for him in a perfect matchup. And, I mean, for all of Pittsburgh's faults, they they do have still a pretty impressive forward group. And so if the plan is just pass it up and move it to the forwards, he just picked up either the best or the second best person on the planet to help do that for you on the back end. So I, I think he's going to be just fine out there in Pittsburgh. Um Back to back North is not expecting that, but I think he'll he'll, he'll acquit himself quite well. Hey, those games are going to be fun to watch, and uh, there'll be plenty of goals. And as I said, we'll see whether Jari can uh, make any saves for his five year deal at uh, five plus or whatever that uh, that he got. Speaking of defense, let's bring this back to the Winnipeg Jets. Um, we spent a lot of time talking about the logjam, the number of players that are there. It. it if you're shoveled off right now, realizing what is possible, I mean, in a very difficult trade market, how might things look different to you once we drop the puck on the regular season? Or are we going to have basically the same six guys um, 
and waiting for one of the younger players to show that, um, you know, they're higher on the depth chart than one of the guys that's getting the ice time from coach. Yeah, I mean, I think the thing that I feel, the only thing I feel confident in us is that we see one of Hanel and Stanley move. Um, not for much mid-round pick, maybe a forward of like a similar caliber, right? But like nothing, nothing. I, I just think when it comes to actually shoring up some of the log jam and without losing anybody for free, I mean, that's that, that's more on the, the negative side of things. It's an option, unfortunately. I'm going to try to assume that the team avoids losing one of their defensemen on waivers once again. But I mean, that, that to me is a move you can make any day of the week. I mean, salary's got to be like, what, a mil-ish for, for both of those guys? Teams are going to take chances on former first round picks in their early twenties all the time. So I mean that that to me the the Stanley Handler debate who gets moved I guess would be the one that you would have to try to break down there. But I I do feel like one of those two defensemen is going to be moved by the time game one gets underway, uh, just to ensure that Declan Chisholm isn't given a make the NHL squad or be put on waiver situation. And then the only other move uh, that I think is of any, you know, viability Huss, would be Brandon Dillon on on the trade block. And I I I would probably lean towards him not being moved at this point because doesn't it feel like barring injury that most of these teams have their rosters completely set, their defensive depth charts all set? And I mean you're talking about the difficulty of moving any money and I know he's not a big ticket but 3-4 mil ish. I, I think a lot of teams might look at that and say, well, why don't we give one of our young guys a shot instead of trying to squeeze that in at this moment? So if you're asking me what it looks like and what the situation is, I I think the only real difference that I'm expecting right now is that Chisholm replaces one of Hanela and Stanley who depart. Other than that, that we somehow miraculously end up with the same decor for the second or third straight season. The one guy that I think could potentially be available on waivers and if he's claimed he's claimed would be capo bianco i mean people forget too, yeah. Yeah. that he has one more year on a one-way deal <laughs> with this team right now and i don't know i've sort of been of the opinion that it was likely that stanley would probably be in some sort of an off-season move considering you know his tenure here the fact that he's been passed by dylan sandberg who plays a similar sort of a role that logan stanley does but I'm not sure whether that is the case. And listen, he's going to get a deal done, I would imagine, at some point. I mean, it's not going to be onerous for a team. I mean, it'll be in and around a million bucks, give or take 50 or 100 grand, I'm sure. And at that point, I, I've always thought that there'd be another team that would take a chance on Logan Stanley. I guess the matter is what comes back. And if you're talking about, well, let's include Vili Hainala because he's in somewhat of a similar situation being you know, a lower round, first round pick that still has potential that hasn't really clicked or popped at the NHL level. If the Jets did trade one of those players, certainly you could get a pick back. The other thing that I think would make sense to me would potentially be another prospect player at either defense or forward, but one that is maybe a couple years younger, that's from one of the last couple drafts that the Jets feel that, you know, might be able to come play, but their timeline is a little different from those guys. Um, would that make sense to you? Yeah, yeah. I, I, I think that, that really would be the only assets you'd be able to get back at this point of, of any value. So, I mean, again, though, I'm not looking to – I'm not expecting the Jets to break the bank in terms of a return for either one of those guys. I mean, they're both NHL players. How how high their their ceiling is. I mean, it remains to be seen for Villy. I think we know what Logan Stanley is at this point. Probably a, a six seven tweener. Uh, not not height, but like six defenseman, seventh defenseman <laughs> tweener. Um which is fine. I mean, like he's he's kind of proven a lot of people, including myself, wrong that thought he would never sniff the NHL. I, I think he can be like I I'd I'd feel okay if he was my my sixth defenseman and we kind of use him for size and to kill penalties and things like that. I I think there's nothing wrong with that. Billy is just, you know, continues to be an unknown here. And, you know, who knows how happy he would be either being the seventh defenseman here in Winnipeg where he's a, a quote-unquote NHLer, but still not able to get any game time as well. So, again, it's it's not going to be a major return for either one of those. It's not going to be a major return for Brandon Dillon either. Um, but 
I, I just can't really envision a scenario that sees three, maybe four defensemen being moved heading into the middle of August now. And we're a month away from training camp, essentially. Um, if anything was going to be done, to me, it would have happened by July 1st or 2nd. At this point, I think the roster is what the roster is, barring some move out of left field that none of us can foresee coming with a Shafley or a Hellebuck. Well, and, and again, I mean, I know we've talked a lot about the trade deadline and what mm, the Winnipeg Jets might do and how much a lot of it depends on where the team is in the standings. But I will say this. I think I'm maybe a little bit more high on Brendan Dillon's trade value, especially if he was available at the trade deadline without term on the end of his contract. I mean, man, we've seen bigger, strong defensemen play big-time roles. And while... You know, he won't show up on the score sheet a lot during the regular season. Uh, listen, this is a copycat league. Look at the the horses that the Vegas Golden Knights were rolling out. Brendan Dillon is a similar type of player that I think could play on a lot of playoff teams, and that size, strength, intensity that he brings, I think would be of quite a bit of value. But at the same time, I think the Winnipeg Jets really re like, like him a lot and realize that He's one of the few guys on the JetBlue line that has that sort of a skill set, and I'm not sure they'd be looking to get rid of him. But to me, Brendan Dillon would definitely have value at the trade deadline. Whether you're getting the two second-round picks you gave up for him a little while ago, I'm not sure if that is the case. But as opposed to some of the other players, I mean, Brendan Dillon's going to play for a team if he gets traded into going into the playoffs at the deadline. Yeah, you know, it's interesting, right? Because... It's two different kinds of value, I guess, the Jets are looking at here. Like One is what you're talking about there, where I, like, I would imagine you get a second-round pick for Brandon Dillon at the trade deadline. It, it, probably in the, the latter half of the second round, but we, we see big defensemen all the time. And we see bigger defensemen nowhere near Brandon Dillon's talent level, in my opinion, get second-round picks. So I, I would imagine the Jets are able to extract some value from him there. So if you're talking about, you know, how do we... How do we extract the most trade value out of the asset that is Brendan Dillon? 100%. The trade deadline's the way to go. But the other bit of value, and in, in, I guess speaking about the Winnipeg Jets organization as a whole, is you know how much and, and can you put a, a value worth on Declan Chisholm having a chance to play 70 games, on Vili Hainala getting a chance to get into an NHL lineup for more than a couple of weeks at a time? Like there, there's a lot of value to be had in finally giving a spot for your younger defenseman to step into the lineup and and play legitimate big minutes. I don't know what the value is, right? Like I don't know what the difference is between those two. Like if you were to move Dylan for very little now, as opposed to what you could get at the trade deadline, like I don't know what the trade off might be there. It it probably just comes down to, I guess, like an organizational philosophy. But those would be the two differing points you'd have to battle with here. Um, and I think they're also two different pathways in terms of how you're trying to build your team. You know, if you're holding on to Brendan Dillon for the here and now, it's to try to make a run at a wild card or even higher playoff spot. Um, if you're looking to move him earlier, then you know what? There's there's going to be a lot to be had in giving some of your 20 year old defensemen some legitimate time here. So it's it's interesting how you can look at it a few different ways there. Um, I, I don't know what the right answer is, but. It, it just it would suck for a third straight year to have defensemen as talented as Chisholm, Hanela, I mean some of the other guys in the system as well, to have them just in limbo here, not getting much of a chance at the NHL level when they've shown that they can already dominate the level below them. Yeah, I, listen, here's the thing. I mean, it's very different between the two. Declan Chisholm has had a cup of coffee up here during yeah. a, due to injury but has shown that he's ready to take that next step and deserves an opportunity. Villy, and I'm a Villy fan. I mean, I still hold out high hopes that, you know, he can turn into the player that we uh, thought the Winnipeg Jets were getting when he was drafted. The problem with Villy, and, and listen, one of these guys needs to do this. They're going to get tons of opportunity to play in the preseason. Presumably at some point they're in a game in real live bullet NHL action. I mean, they got to take advantage of the opportunity. I mean, there, there's something to be said for giving guys experience, but you got to go show you're ready and you got to show that you're one of the six best guys on the team. I mean, at the end of the day, the coach has a responsibility to put the best team out there to win the game that night. And unless you're tanking, which, I mean, the Winnipeg Jets aren't. And 
the one thing that I think we've all sort of been left wanting from Billy is we've seen how good he can be at times. We've seen the things that he does well, but it just hasn't all come together when he's been given NHL time and minutes. And unfortunately for him, it has been crowded. He's been a guy that they can, his waiver's exempt and can go down to the Manitoba Moose. But I mean, at a certain point, I mean, you got to get out there and make the most of that opportunity and make the decision a, a no brainer that, listen, we got to figure out some way to do it because this guy needs to be in our lineup. He's good. He belongs. Yeah, no, I mean, that that's fair. And it, it's funny because, to be honest, I'm not a, a massive believer in Hanela being like a top four defenseman or anything. Like, I, I just don't think skating wise, he's up to par in terms of, you know, the deficiencies he has with his size to, to overcome that at the NHL level. But I mean, the Jets, the, the Jets have blocked these defensive prospects for so long now. Like there, there's, there's, I, I don't think an argument against it. I agree that, you know, going back to last preseason where it was Sandberg, Hanela, Stanley, maybe some of the other guys, it wasn't like Hanela, you know, jumped off the page and, you know, made it absolutely certain that he was going to get into the lineup, but, but there were no spots for these guys. Like there's, there's just, there's, there's Sandberg not enough. found a way. There, there was one, but on top of that, you also lost Johnny Kovacevic on waivers because there were no spots to be had there. And the other spots that were available were a seventh defenseman, which, you know, you, you don't want to pigeonhole some of your well, younger I mean, defenders. In, in, in all fairness, where was Johnny Kovacevic on the depth chart? Tenth? No, well, but because there were no opportunities for him to step in legitimately. I thought he showed himself really well the prior year in the I NHL. Did too. So, it, it, right? Like, it wasn't – I mean, you talk about – go out there and make an impact in the games you get a chance he legitimately did and then there were no chances for him and then he gets sent out onto waivers which is the exact situation the Jets find themselves in this year Uh, albeit you know maybe a little less certainty with Chisholm playing less than Kovacevic had at the time so I mean that I I I understand both sides I I really do but I, I've made this point, and I, I don't want to repeat myself too often here, but I, I do think that if the Jets, if their goal, if you know their realization that as a small market team they have to do things differently and they want to draft and develop, part of developing means leaving open Play some spots some point. <laughs> for your draftees to get into there. So, so that's that. I, I just I do believe the Jets really need to step back and take a look at at how they're building out some of their rosters, and they have to. Look, they, there's the complaint all the time that guys don't want to come here by trade. You know, we try to do this and this, but nobody... Okay, so what are you doing to differentiate yourselves then? One of the ways you can do that is by taking a bit of a chance and playing more of your 20, 21, 22 year old. The irony, the irony of that whole bit is that this logjam is because the Jets did acquire two veteran guys that agreed to come here and Brendan yeah. Dillon and Nate Schmidt. And, you know, the Schmidt deal, uh, it, it, I think that if their culture was in a different spot, that trade's never made. I mean, I really do think that he came in as much to be a guy that could lighten the mood and be, I mean, the Jets really did need that guy at that time coming out of that miserable season and the way things ended up and just the way everything had been trending. But, um, I mean, we all joked about the uh, reacquisition of Matt Hendricks as the director of morale there a little while ago. I mean, you know, it, it, it's a lot to have a guy on your books at $6 million taking up a roster spot uh, and being in a spot where you could probably play younger, cheaper players that certainly have a brighter future um, because of some of the intangibles that he brings to it. And... You know, I do wonder about Schmidt's role with the club this year. I mean, listen, I think if they were able to make some sort of a deal, that probably would have happened already. That is a very, very difficult trade, a difficult contract to move. Um, But at a certain point, I mean, if he's your sixth defenseman, even if he's making that much money, to your point, I think it really is incumbent to get some of these other guys the opportunity to get into the lineup and play it. Hey, two weeks into the season, we could be talking about three guys on IR and everybody's in there and it's sink or swim. Yeah. And that is something that happens. And they've sort of been uncharacteristically healthy, really, over the course of the last couple of years. A lot of the guys have been playing. But, man, it is it is a real catch-22 right now because, you know, once they made those two acquisitions, um, it, it really – well, first of all, they didn't have money to sign Andrew Kopp. 
And that's actually turned out quite well with, you know, what ended up happening with that trade. Um, but I mean, there's no real end in sight, especially with another year on Schmidt's contract afterwards. So, you know, I know we talk a lot about these big players and who may or may not get moved. To me, the most interesting and maybe the most important storyline of the Winnipeg Jets is how things shake out on that blue line. Who's on the club? Who gets a chance to play? And is there a spot in the lineup for any of these young players that have been patiently waiting their turn to show that they're ready to go? Yeah. I mean, the only reason I don't even mention Schmidt in, uh, at all in any of this is just I, I think it's untradeable at this point. So it's, it's I, I, hey, if they can, it's great. I just think it's a moot point because, you know, realistically, unless you're tacking a first round pick on onto that contract, you're not moving it out. And, and the Jets. That's a no you know, go. For, 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 yeah, it's a, it should have 100% be an absolute no go there. And I, and I don't even mind when they made the initial trades for Dylan and Schmidt, because the team was in a slightly different, like they, it was more of let's go for it. We want a little more depth on our blue line here. And I, I, I guess that was also while Morris, he wasn't the, the guy that he is right now. So it was more of a, let's try to be deep one through six. And with our goaltender and with our forward core, that could be enough to get us through, right? Like that they were more in a contending mindset at that time. So I, like, I don't have a problem going out there and making those moves. But you also have to pivot when when circumstances change. And I think they've changed in a massive, massive way for the Jets right now in that, you know what, some of these younger guys can deliver equal or more value at a quarter of the price, you know, an eighth of the price, whatever it might be. And if that's the case, then you've got to pivot and, and, and try to move on from that as quickly as possible. Plus, they're not in a, you know, challenging for one of the top spots in the division spot anymore. Right. So the, the, there's a few different things here. Um, again, I don't mind the moves at the time, but it's come back to bite them a little bit here. There, there's no doubt about that in terms of opening up some room for some of their youngsters to uh, to get into the lineup. But I mean, you're also right too, Huss, where all it takes is a couple of weeks of training camp and a few preseason games and either the Jets or another team out there find themselves battling the injury bug and things might change pretty drastically and pretty quickly for the team. So yeah, we'll see what happens. Yeah, I mean, and listen, I don't know if anything... I mean, it, listen, if you're talking about a potential Schmidt deal, I, I've always thought that maybe there was a player that was similarly relatively overpaid. I mean, had a cap hit that didn't really work within their club. And, and just the numbers. I mean, maybe they have more needs on defense than they do on forwards and have a guy that's making five or six mil for a couple of years that you could make some sort of a swap that essentially makes it a bit more of a wash. Um, but I'm not sure that even that trade is there right now. I mean, it was funny. It was rumored that Nate Schmidt was part of that, uh, that Philly potential Philly deal with Travis Sanheim. Yeah. Um, and in a way it just shows that Philly, I whatever the guys running Philly right now, maybe didn't have the confidence in Travis Sanheim at that price for eight years and would be more than willing to take a similarly contract or maybe a player that's not even at the Sanheim level at six million, as long as it was only six million for two years, as opposed to the yeah. eight that they had already signed up to pay the Manitoba native. Yeah, I mean that that was an interesting one too, because it, it doesn't alleviate the log jam for the Jets at all. No. But in in theory, at least you're significantly enhancing your 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 defense group there. Plus, you're locking in somebody for eight years, which is always a win for the Jets. But yeah, and Caps I mean, I wonder. Here. But I think that, like, as as far as what I understood at the time, the Flyers were adamant that you know a first round pick be included in the deal. And so I wonder, like, now that we know what happened during the draft, would Jets fans be okay with Nate Schmidt and Colby Barlow for Travis Sanheim? Absolutely not. And I think the well, Jets go. themselves would have been. <laughs> yeah. I mean, they knew. Even where they were picking, they were going to have the uh, like some pretty great options of a number of players. And that is exactly the way that it turned out. I mean, you had that kid from the U.S. National Development Team with Oliver Moore. He was there. Yep. They ended up pulling the trigger on Barlow. But there was, uh, I believe Perot was still there too, Gabe if Perot, I'm not yep. mistaken. So um, I, holding on to that pick, I think, certainly was the prudent one to do. But... When it comes to those young players, um, and again, like I would love to see Chisholm get an opportunity to play a few games and 
you know, be confident out there and, you know, kind of get used to it. But, I mean, it is going to be a dogfight in every single practice, never mind games, for every one of those guys just to peg themselves in the pecking order, even if they're not in the top six, as to where they are when they come in to get a uh, to get a chance. And you know, when we're talking about training camp stories, I mean, there'll be all sorts of stories about, you know, the bonus explosion at the end of the season, uh, off-season talks, how's everybody feeling? But really, when we're looking at personnel, I think we got a pretty good idea about the way the forward group is going to look. And I'm actually pretty high on it, even with losing Pierre-Luc Dubois. I think the new players coming in, the depth that the LA Kings guys and the different skill sets that they bring could actually help the Jets quite a bit. I do wonder how this defense core takes a step forward. And there's two things that could happen. A younger player going in, usurping a veteran, and you know, adding something new. And the other one, Brandon is a big bounce back season from Neil Pionk. And I I mean, as long as he's on this team, he's going to be playing significant minutes. And like, you you can't argue with the points that he's put up. I mean, he had another 30 odd points last year, seven and five games in the playoffs. Um, But something significantly has come off over the last couple of seasons when it comes to turnovers, puck management plays in their own end. And Listen, someone at a much higher pay grade to me that could maybe lock a player in and get them back in there. But if that were to happen, I'm not sure there's any guy that could have more of an impact on an improvement of the Jet defense than Neil Pionk, who has so much opportunity to do it playing as much as he does. Yeah, I mean, if you're looking for silver linings, I thought the first 65, 70 games he was he was brutal. I mean, it just it was it wasn't there for him. But I thought the last ten or so games of the regular season, and then the the playoffs against Vega, I, I I thought he was right up, just a bit behind Josh Morrissey in terms of impact play from the back end. Like he he really did turn it around at the end. I, I mean, his best game of the year was that that wild one against Minnesota, uh, where I, I was just blown away with how how well he was able to step up in that one. And then once Morrissey went down against Vegas, he was really really good for the Jets. So. You need that guy, obviously. Like that, if, if if you're not getting him, that's a big five point nine million dollar hole on on the second pairing there. So there, yeah, there's no doubt about it. They need they need more out of him. The the common refrain has been that you know injuries have played a role in that. Well, then they needed to be healthy. <laughs> like there's not really much there's not really much time for excuses. I, I like it doesn't matter too much to me what the issue is. One year, sure, but you know when it's happening year in year out. You, you, you got to be out there on the ace at, at close to 100%, and you got to be an effective player when you're out there. So, I mean, yeah, that that would be a massive, massive boost to this team. And, I mean, they could have three effective defense pairings. Like, there, there's there's no doubt about that. Uh, who that is, I don't know yet, but but the possibility is there for them, and it would be a great story at least to have. I mean, it would be nice to see the – the what's the town in Minnesota they're both from? Uh, to have the Herman Minnesota town. boys. Yeah, like have Sandberg Pionk out there on the second pair. And then, I mean, if they can give you that behind a Norrissey campaign, Norrissey 2.0, eh, maybe, maybe things might not be so bad. Hey, just before we go, I know you're a big golf guy. Did you see this report about Phil Mickelson today? Sorry, I, I, I couldn't yeah. pick you up there, Huss. Can you mute bombing, uh, Reem, if you don't mind? Um, did you see this report on Phil Mickelson today? The yeah. fact that he gambled over $1 billion and uh, the guy that he was in cahoots with that ended up going to jail and he feels that Phil, with one simple public statement, could have prevented it but didn't do it. Um, Phil asked him to put a massive bet down on the Ryder Cup that he was participating in. I guess we know why he ended up on the live tour. <laughs> I'm kind of, I, I mean, there's a few things I'm blown away by, Huss. One is that, Okay, he put up a he put up a bill in betting, but he's claiming that he only lost a hundred mil, which which leads me to believe that he he actually is a pretty damn good better when his when his bets do end up going to the books. I mean, there's that part of it. The other one too, though, is the lack of outrage about. I, I guess it depends how legitimate you think the allegation is, but I mean, as far as I know, betting in sports while you're playing has been the ultimate no no for. For centuries. See Rose, Pete. Yeah, see 1919 Black Sox. Like it's, I'm kind of blown away how everyone just like everyone's kind of lap. Maybe it's just the the different climate we live in where there's gambling sponsors on every single segment of every single, you know, television broadcast that we, maybe we're desensitized to it a little bit. 
but I feel like this should be a little more sensational than than what it's been so far. Like, if, if anything, I mean, I guess the PGA is not the PGA anymore. It's like the live slash PGA. But you know, I, I would think that, you know, if that happened in any other sport, that would be grounds for a lifetime ban. But it seems like everybody's just having a laugh about it over Twitter on on a Thursday afternoon. So we'll see, we'll see what happens there. But that's. Yeah, that that's not overly surprising. Maybe the total number is a little bit more than I might have guessed. But if you, uh, yeah, if you've been following golf the last uh, decade or so, yeah, you would you would know that Phil uh, Phil en- Phil enjoys hitting the sports books in Vegas uh, time no, and time again. Nobody more. I mean, it's a fascinating story. I mean, this Billy Walters who was about as sharp as they come. Phil approached him to uh, partner up with him, and he said he's only going to do it if Phil had access to higher limits than he already had, which, of course, he did because he was betting so much and often very, very recklessly. Um, that ended up winning. But, I mean, it, 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 uh, $1 billion in bets spanning three decades, $100 million in losses, bet 110 k to win 100 k 1115 times um and at one point uh one point in june of the uh, of one of the months of the of the one of the years 143 wagers in one day um hey it's his money he can do with it what he wants and i don't think he was ever in that bad of shape but i'll tell you what this story um and the book is called gambler secrets of a life at risk by billy walters Alan uh, Shipnock at Fire Pit Collective done a great job in following this, and they're not mentioning any of his the personal things that uh, have been rumored for a while, but just this story alone, and the fact that Billy Walters said, "Are you freaking crazy?" when he wanted to put a wager on the uh, on the Ryder Cup, <laughs> it's just I mean, sometimes guys get a little in over their head, or they think they are. Phil does seem I mean they call him Fig Jam for a reason. He's never been short on confidence, and uh, I think that even got the best of him in a certain situation. It'd be fascinating to see uh, if he comments on this at any point. Uh, I think lives at Bedminster this week, and uh, then of course, oh, nice. lots of talk over our cup. Well, you're I'll, not tuning I'll in. Make sure, I'll make sure to check that out on the CW. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Hey, Deshambo, fifty-eight last week is pretty wild. <laughs> hey, buddy, have a great one, and uh, let's just hope that we've got some juicy content to talk about in the next. Uh, few weeks before training camp because it's been a little lean when it comes to the hockey talk as of late but what the heck it's august we can wait for the good stuff yeah it's it's <laughs> ranking season at skates and plates so that that's how you know where we're at right now doing, you know, i doing hope you're ranking the... what's really important to us let's get some rankings on the plate side of things the skates can wait till september i mean yeah like I no don't, no no like... we'll, we'll... We'll we'll bring something out there. I, I was at the the St. Norbert Market last weekend, and uh, yeah, I dug into a couple uh, local beauties there. So I'll I'll see if I can come up with something for for next week's episode for you. Well, you know what? I'll tell you what. If nothing happens, if we are still at this same standstill when it comes to the Jets off season and Jets talk, I think next week when you come on with me, I think we may just have to own it and do a segment on food as opposed to hockey okay Love I, know, it. I know you will be and vice versa available if you need a guest for the plate segment of skates yeah. and plates <laughs> talked enough about the skates lately dude have a great one thanks for uh, thanks for coming on yeah beauty man have a go and we'll talk soon <laughs> you got it there is uh, our boy brandon rawicki check out skates and plates wherever you get your favorite pods all right bombers elks tonight uh, of course the bombers are back i believe it's the 24th and uh It's going to be the Princess Auto game. Princess Auto, proud sponsors of the Winnipeg Blue Bombers. But really, in a lot of ways, every game is the Princess Auto game because the Princess Auto tailgate is where to be two hours before every game. 350 popping hot dogs, $5 beers, DJ finesse spinning. It uh, it just gets getting better and better every game. What a great atmosphere. Princess Auto, proud sponsors of WST and the Bombers. And the uh, place where you'll find the best deals on the most unique assortment of tools and equipment around. Everything you need to complete the projects on your list or start something new is at Princess Auto. Shop online 24-7, 365 at princessauto.com. Um, man, our, our boys, uh, Joe, Spicy, Gino and the gang out of Consolidated Supply. I know they'll be watching the game tonight, but uh, they're busy right now because Consolidated Supply are the leaders in irrigation systems, artificial turf, and golf carts, 
both new and used as the exclusive club car dealer in Manitoba and have other great options for your property, including hot tubs and amazing outdoor kitchen options. And of course, are the leaders in small engine parts and repair. So much consolidated supply can do for you and your property. Pop by and see them at the showroom, open to the public, 1395 Niaqua Road East, or find out more online at cte.ca. Uh, hey, getting together with your pals to watch the game tonight? Uh, if you uh, need to upgrade your bomber gear just in time for kickoff, uh, head on down to Royal Sports, 750 Pemina Highway. If you've never been in Royal Sports, um, you probably won't believe it the first time you go in. Uh, it used to be a car dealership. Now is the biggest, best, and most packed sports store you'll find anywhere. Uh, but for local sports fans, tons of Blue Bomber gear, including a lot of exclusives that you won't find anywhere else. Thousands of pieces of Jets merchandise. NFL merch coming in by the day. Blue Jays, Major League Baseball, Raps NBA, World Soccer, and more. Of course, a massive hockey department. And all the great things to uh, do in summer. Soccer, baseball, football, volleyball, tennis equipment, disc golf, and a huge selection of bikes. Pop down and see them. 750 Pemina Highway. And follow them on Instagram at Royal Sports Pemina. And speaking of going out with the gang to watch the uh, game tonight, uh, yeah, you can pop by Royal Sports, grab some new blue to, uh, to wear, and then head on down to your local Boston Pizza, the best place to get together with friends for the big game is always your local BP. Enjoy ice cold schooners, world famous BP wings, gourmet pizzas, and the latest from the Boston Pizza feature menu. Staying in tonight for the game, order online at bostonpizza.com. All right. Let's welcome in the host of uh, Blue Bomber, uh, Bomber Game Day and, Day and More and from uh, Bonfire, Bonfire Sports, Sports. Darren, Darren Bombing. Bombing. DB, DB, what's, what's going, going on? on? I'm good, Huss. How are things? Uh, things, uh, are things are well. I'm well. looking, forward, looking to forward to this game, game tonight. tonight. Yeah, you know, me too. A lot of people maybe look past the Edmonton Elks as uh, a game, you know, to, to watch in a four-game slate in the CFL. But we're at a point right now where this team is winless at home in forever, winless this season as well, obviously. And, hey, you know, injured dog, the most dangerous. Uh, they, they're they coming off a bye week. They've made some changes uh, on the offensive side of the ball that I know you and I will get into. Uh, I wouldn't, you know, I think this is going to be more of a football game than a lot of people maybe think. Yeah, yeah. totally. Um, hey, you know what, DB? We're getting some feedback from your speakers. If you want, just uh, pop out and then pop back in and we should be uh, we Should, should be, be good, good now, I bet. Oh, okay, perfect. Um, yeah, those changes, I mean, they are significant. Jarius Jackson's in at OC. And Trey Ford's finally getting a chance to play this year after being mired at the bottom of the depth chart. Now, listen, coaches make decisions for reasons. It was very clear he wasn't impressing anybody in training camp. But um, what a spot to come in <laughs> and regain the starting position when you welcome in the Winnipeg Blue Bombers coming off of that absolute steamrolling they did at the British Columbia Lions that last week. It feels like the Bombers have a lot of momentum coming in. And, of course, they saw this team just a couple of weeks ago here in Winnipeg. Yeah, and it wasn't exactly a hugely decisive victory for the Blue Bombers either. It was 6-6 at halftime, and the final score, 28-14 for the Bombers, probably flattered Winnipeg uh, if, if you're being really honest with yourself in, in what we saw in that game. That all said, just to catch people up on what's happening in Edmonton, coaching change, but no, not Chris Jones. And I've spoken at length on Bonfire Sports about why that probably is the case. But they did demote their offensive coordinator, Stephen McAdoo, to an assistant role on the defensive side of the football, which is interesting. So still on the staff, nothing changes there. Jarius Jackson, the former CFL quarterback um, that actually broke the hearts of Blue Bomber fans many, many years ago when he was quarterback of the Calgary Stampeders. He is the new offensive play caller. So Edmonton makes this change during a bye week and they promote their second year Canadian quarterback, incredibly athletic, Trey Ford to the starting job. 
Taylor Cornelius will handle third string duties. He'll handle the short yardage and that sort of thing. Jarrett Daggy, who's, you know, we've seen a little bit this year in Edmonton at quarterback. He'll be the number two. So Trey Ford comes in. That's a bit of a wrinkle. Not a lot of film on him. And a new offensive play caller with Jarius Jackson pulling the trigger on what Edmonton will do when they're on the field with possession. So this might present... Uh, it's a bit of an unknown. It's it's not even a bit of an unknown. It's a big unknown because l- less film on Trey Ford. This will be his third start. He's one and two in his career. And then a new play caller. Things could look very, very different for Edmonton. Yes, they're the most penalized team in the CFL. Yes, their offensive line has not been good, but they have been doing it with an incapable quarterback with Taylor Cornelius. So I expect tonight Edmonton to come out with some things that Winnipeg is not expecting. The Blue Bombers, of course, are healthy. Getting Winston Rose back last week, getting Kyrie Wilson, maybe even more notably for at weak side linebacker, getting him back last week. Winnipeg is clicking on all cylinders. They are healthy. Zero changes from the roster last week in that huge win over BC to this week in Edmonton. Bit of a short week for them. Edmonton coming off the bye, as I mentioned. I do think it will be a closer football game. Do I think Edmonton will win? Do I think Edmonton will put up uh, a serious threat against the best team in the Canadian Football League? No, I don't. Yeah, I I think most people are wondering the uh, most important question. Will they cover? the 12 and a half points right. that they're getting at, uh, getting at home. Um, I, I mean, you know, you, you said that a lot of people might skip Elks games. I mean, I'm sort of with you. I mean, to me, this is a must see team. I mean, the way they have found the ways they have found to lose football games this year <laughs> been incredible. I mean, the goal yeah. line stand against Saskatchewan in week one, I mean, having an 11-3 lead in the dying minutes of the game, giving up a, uh, or sorry, I guess, yeah, giving up the eight-point touchdown, and then the single, listen, I mean, it has been somewhat a comedy of errors, but in a lot of ways, it has been a house of horrors for that organization. And, I mean, let's be real here. A win, breaking the streak at any point is going to be massive for them just to get that monkey off their back. But to do it against a team like the Winnipeg Blue Bombers in the most improbable of ways is not something that I think is going to salvage this season, but can at least get them moving forward to a place where progress is possible. Because if it is possible, they've actually regressed this season after the year they had last year. Yeah, I, I, I think that's fair. You know, uh, it is the CFL, the crazy football league. We have seen weirder things than an Edmonton Elks win over the Blue Bombers tonight. You know, we, we've seen stranger things happen. Um, that all said, I, I think, you know, like I mentioned right off the top, a wounded dog is the most dangerous. Edmonton is desperate. They have nothing to lose right now. And because they're playing at home, because that guaranteed ticket is still riding high, I think it was like a $100 ticket or something like that, game one, and until the Elks win, that ticket is good for admission every single home game until they capture a win. Um, I, I'm sure, you know, the the penny pushers and, and the, uh, the accountants and the rest in Edmonton are, are, you know, pleading with the football gods for a huge upset to happen tonight just for the Edmonton Elks bottom line. But that all aside, Edmonton being a team with nothing to lose, uh, being a team that is just, as you mentioned, as really everybody has talked about all season long, finding new ways to just blow it. Something has to give eventually. Mike O'Shea did not mince words uh, in talking about the Edmonton Elks this week. And he said, they will not go the whole season without winning a game. They will win a game eventually. Of course, he's preparing his team to face Edmonton like any other team that he will face. And he doesn't expect it to happen this week, but uh, Edmonton is going to tweak things. They are going to change things. And and at this point, I really feel for Edmonton sports fans. Yeah. They lost their sports talk radio station, big ups to um, uh, Lieutenant Eric and our good friend, Dustin Nielsen for getting Edmonton sports talk fired up and uh, you know, following your great lead hustler uh, and doing that in Edmonton. But the fans are suffering because uh, the football team, the, the entertainment all summer 
is one that is supposed to kind of, you know, help them through till hockey season starts. And it's been a point of pride. It's the city of champions. This is a proud fan base. And, you know, to, to get a win at home, I think would be monumental. You're right. Uh, a win will at least help turn things in the right direction because they are not going to make huge Chris Jones uh, level changes this season. That's just the way it is. So we'll see what Trey Ford can do. Maybe a little, uh, you know, even playing a good football game against the class of the CFL and the Blue Bombers, that can be a real positive for the Elks moving forward this season. You know, Darren, uh, I will disagree on one thing. You said the Edmonton Elks have nothing left to lose. Actually, they have 10 more games to lose. The perfect season <laughs> well, is still very much alive, although I don't believe that season. is going to happen. Yeah. I, I, I am... I, I'm very interested to see what Ford is able to do. And to be honest, I mean, listen, I got a lot of confidence in the Bomber defense, especially the way they suffocated BC last week, regardless of who was in at quarterback. But when you look at Trey Ford, the one thing that the Bombers have been victimized this year at times, and hell, this goes all the way back to Chad Kelly in the fourth quarter of the Grey Cup, mm. is quarterbacks being able to find a little bit of space and running for big, big chunks of yardage. Cornelius did it, uh, you know, and obviously we all remember the crumb back and what Dustin Crumb did in the second half. Um, to me, maybe the most crucial thing for Winnipeg to do is to maintain the contain of the pocket and not let Trey Ford get out. Because, I, listen, I don't have a lot of confidence that this guy's going to do much in the passing game. But I'll tell you what, if they're able to, eat, you know, move 25 and 30 yard gains, score some points and give him some confidence running the football, I mean, that's been the one thing the Bombers have been somewhat susceptible to. That being said, they certainly weren't susceptible to it last week. No, absolutely. I think Bombers fans are fully aware of the danger opposing quarterbacks legs have presented this season. Uh, the new play caller in Edmonton, Jarius Jackson, we've got to remember he is a quarterback. I, I think he is probably going to find ways to get the ball out of Trey Ford's hands quickly as a young quarterback, just to get the confidence going, get the continuity going and, um, you know, uh, balance things out because we know what he can do with his legs. And we know that Edmonton has a very, very good running back in Kevin. Brown, who really exploded uh, on the CFL scene with Edmonton late last season. He hasn't really been able to get much going this year because Edmonton hasn't been able to stay on the field. Edmonton will be creative. They do have weapons in their receiving core, and notably Dylan Mitchell uh, and, and Stephen Dunbar, getting Manny Arsenault back, a big physical uh, veteran guy that might not be as explosive in the receiving game as he has been through the first decade of his career, but uh, a great leader and uh, somebody that's going to definitely be an impact in the blocking game and the run game uh, as well. Kieran Moore, another free agent they signed from the Saskatchewan Rough Riders, also a very talented, um, you know, explosive receiver that uh, they can get the ball into the hands of and, and make some things happen. But when tr you look at Trey Ford and the athleticism and the things that he's able to do, he is a smaller quarterback. He's about as completely opposite of a running quarterback than Taylor Cornelius is. Cornelius is fast, but big and strong. Trey Ford, much more, um, you know, fleet of foot and quick than uh, than a power guy, smaller body for sure. So, you know, the layman fan might say, well, they got to put a spy on the quarterback to ensure that, uh, you know, he, he doesn't take off and, and beat the Blue Bombers for big, long runs. I think uh, a bigger strategy that Richie Hall's defense will employ is just bringing lots of pressure often and early because if you can get a young quarterback off of his game then everything else will fall into place and if i haven't said it enough i will say it again right here on winnipeg sports talk hustler when you look at the best players in the cfl today and those who would be in the running for mop at the end of the year everybody will talk about zach Kolaris. everybody will talk about chad kelly they'll always lead with the quarterbacks mark my words Willie Jefferson is the best player in the Canadian Football League today. I will die on that stance because he is more of an impact than any other player on the field. I know every play starts with the ball in the quarterback's hands and seeing Zach Kolaris throw for 300 plus yards four times this season has people thinking he will capture a third straight MOP. He very well may. But I'm going to do everything in my power to have people understand 
that Willie Jefferson is on that same level of impact on the football field in the CFL. And I think he deserves that accolade as much as anybody. Yeah, well, listen, I'm here for that take um, and here for the conversation. I mean, I still think that the nature of the quarterback position and how much the game relies on it will always have, I mean, the deck sort of stacked in favor of the top sure. quarterback. But from a defensive side of things, I mean, Willie has been an absolute game wrecker, although He's been wrecking a lot more of the game when his boy Jackson Jeffcoat's on the other side, and uh, man, has he made an impact um, since being back in the uh, in, in the lineup. And that could mean a long, long night for Trey Ford tonight at Commonwealth. Hey, just before we go, uh, what are your thoughts on this Saskatchewan Montreal game? I know Fajardo's been limited in practice. You gotta think he's gonna play against his old team. I'm actually really fired up to see this one and to see what happens because Montreal has sort of quietly, I think, established themselves as the number four team in the league behind the yeah. big three of Winnipeg, BC, and Toronto. But Saskatchewan's yeah. showing some things. They got a young quarterback, just got a win. Their defense, I think, at time has held them in games. Their special teams can break games as well. Um, if I had to just pick one game, obviously I'll always watch the Bombers, but to me, that's the game. Uh, although BC and Calgary is going to be really interesting, but... Thoughts on the Riders going in and playing their old pal Cody Fajardo and, of course, Jason Moss. Yeah, it is a reu uh, reuniting of uh, of those two in Montreal, and now they'll play against their former team in, in Saskatchewan this week. It is the CFL game of the week for me because uh, it's two teams that are headed in the right direction and part of that mushy middle in the CFL that is outside of that top tier, Winnipeg, Toronto, and BC, as you mentioned. Um both of these teams have very, very good defenses, and both of these teams do it at the line of scrimmage. So the defensive lines, in particular Saskatchewan's, is one of the, the, the groups that I enjoy watching in the CFL more than any this year. Anthony Lanier uh, is coming off a three-sack performance last week. They have been all over opposing quarterbacks and just an absolute nuisance every single time they're on the field. Um I don't know what the line is right now as far as Cody Fajardo's health and that sort of thing. Um, you know, they've been playing a little bit of, um, you know, cloak and dagger at Montreal Alouette's practice this week. Fajardo working with the first team and then they're bringing in the other guys. Probably more of a contingency plan. Head coach Jason Moss said, if I was a betting man, I would bet on Cody Fajardo playing. He is officially a game time decision, but I expect him to play. Most people expect Cody Fajardo to play to play just based on reading the tea leaves a little bit and, and expectations. But Montreal is a team that is dangerous. William Stanback will not be in the lineup. Walter Fletcher will start at running back, but I don't see that being too much of an issue. Uh, Cody Fajardo um, is doing enough. He is still mistake prone as he has been, but I think Jason Moss learned a lot of lessons as the offensive coordinator for Cody Fajardo while in Saskatchewan. I think he has figured those things out and puts Cody Fajardo in situations where he can find success. But this game is led by the defenses, both D lines, hellacious absolute menaces to opposing quarterbacks and opposing offensive lines. I can't wait for that game. It's going to be a real tight one. Yeah, well, bring it on tonight. Um, uh, DB, uh, I guess pretty much right after uh, kick, uh, after the final uh, gun, um, you and the Schnitz will be uh, firing it up on the channel. Yes, of course. Uh, Schnitzy's out at the lake, but uh, we got a good internet connection. Uh, game day after dark, as we always do. Uh, pretty much immediately after the game, we'll go live with our post-game show. And for everybody out there that hasn't yet, check out the pregame. Chris Walby has his keys to the game. Uh, the insight from someone like him is really unmatched. Uh, in the Canadian Football League, knows the Blue Bombers top to bottom, and him and I get into some really good debates uh, about what we see on the field and, and the state of the Winnipeg Blue Bombers, where they are right now. Uh, it's really where you can get uh, game ready ahead of Bombers and Elks tonight on Bonfire Sports. Yeah, hit that up after Winnipeg Sports Talk over at the Bonfire Channel. DB, enjoy the game tonight, and we'll look forward to uh, seeing what you guys have cooking after hopefully another Big Bomber win. It should be a fun one. Have a great weekend, Huss. We'll talk soon. Appreciate it. There's DB. Uh, you know, while we're talking about that, let's get to our why not question of the day for not Autocorp over, over at Waverly and McGilvery. Um, th this, now, listen, I know BA in chat, SK have, well, BA particularly, I think SK is just sort of riding with him. Actually think the Elks are going to win this game. 
Um, I think that if we just said, will the Bombers win, the why not question of the day would be 99% to the 1% of those guys. But I am interested. I mean, do you think this game could be close? I mean, the Bombers have had, I mean, listen, Edmonton did cover 14 and a half when they were here a little while ago. The number is 12 and a half. We'll get to the cool bet lines in a minute. But uh, do the Bombers win by 13 or more? I'll let you know what I think on that a little bit later on, but let us know in the chat. Is this a bomber cover tonight or, uh, you know, might we be sweating this out in the fourth quarter? Um, you know what goes great with football? Cold beer. And the best cold beer around this city is Winnipeg's favorite local beer, Little Brown Jug. Get on down to the beautiful new patio, brewery, and tap room on William Avenue where you can try all the seasonal beers, the icons like 1919 and the great new generic lager. And of course you can take home it all, especially right now with issues at liquor marts. Um, if you want the good stuff, just go right to the source, Little Brown Jug on William Avenue. And of course they do have delivery options around the city of Winnipeg at littlebrownjug.ca. Did get a call from Cal yesterday uh, I think sports trivia night number three is in the works, probably coming up next month. We'll let you know more details on that in uh, the coming days. Um, a big shout out to our friends at Aikens Lake Wilderness Lodge. Man, I had a great time there last weekend. Uh, got to count down another 51 or so till we get back out there next year, hopefully. But if you are looking or planning an amazing, whether it be a corporate event, a special trip with friends and family, um, you don't need to be a pro fisherman. Even amateurs like myself can catch big ones with the great service of the guides there. But find out more online, booking well into 2024 right now. Find out more about availability, options at akinslake.com or hit our pal Pitt up on Twitter at Aikens Lake. Um, let me see here. We mentioned the gold eyes going on and we were hopefully going to have Andrew Collier with us today. Um, but he's got a lot going on. Gold Eyes are finishing up their series tonight against Lincoln. Although it doesn't look like it's a great day. There's a potential of rain a little later on. Fingers crossed, though, we don't have to deal with rain tomorrow because it's the big night for welcoming and celebrating the career of Reggie Abercrombie, one of my all-time favorites, uh, both on the field as well as to talk to. And I'm actually going to be taking a step out for part of the show tomorrow to be a part of a hot stove with Reggie at the Gold Eyes Luncheon tomorrow. Um, and then, of course, Saturday is Bark at the Park. You can find out more information on the website on Bark at the Park. But um, if you go to one game all year and you love dogs, make it Saturday night. Um, tickets on sale now. Fireworks tomorrow. Um, the full promo schedule available. But a big, big weekend for our friends at The Fish. Um, let's do a quick uh, look at the uh, leaderboard on the PGA Tour because the FedEx Cup playoffs are underway. And, uh, oh, my guy, Tom Kim with a nice start. Six under par through seven. One shot up on Jordan Spieth, Nick Hardy, and Emiliano Grillo. And a couple Canadian flags in the top five as well. Mac Hughes and Adam Svensson both tied at five, uh, at four under playing the 17th hole. Of course, the uh, playoffs on right now. Adam Hadwin and Corey Connors also in the top 20. Um, you know, and Nick Taylor in there as well. Only 70 players here and five Canadians in this group really speaks to uh, just what a great season Canadians have had on the tour. Of course, our golf reports are brought to you by our friends at Breezy Bend. The brand new 7th and 15th greens are open continued course improvements and a great job to everyone that was involved in that out of Breezy. If you're thinking about a great long-term golfing home for you and your family next season, breezyben.ca. Give Corey Johnson a call over at the clubhouse and uh, get on that waiting list for 2023. All right, let's get Remus back in here. Remo, what's your lean before we get to the cool bet lines on our why not question of the day? Bombers going to run away with this, or uh, is this going to be... Uh, yes, the BA says, if the Bombers blow them out, I will be on holidays Friday. Where are you on that? <laughs> will BA be here saying, I told you so, or uh, are we going to be talking about a uh, a game that, well, the Bomber do what everyone thinks, and certainly the bookmakers say they should do, and that's win by a significant margin. Yeah, I'm, I got to roll with the Bombers here. Us, um, 
Just look, they're rolling. They had a great game. I think Edmonton, you know, maybe the quarterback change helps. Uh, but you have to pick the Bombers in their defense. No lineup changes. Kenny Lawler's back. Uh, they won before against Edmonton. Uh, sorry, Edmonton. I think the losing streak goes to 22 at straight uh, games at home tonight. So I'm going with the Bombers. I thought we looked at the spread earlier in the week, Huss. I thought it was a bit low. Maybe they're giving Edmonton a couple more points. Hasn't um, moved. Yeah, twelve. It's still twelve and a half. So, I, yeah. yeah, I would take. I would take that. Oh uh, yeah, I, I'm going to be throwing in the Bombers. The Bombers are twelve and a half point favorites. Alouettes five and a half point favorites for tomorrow's game against the Riders. BC six point favorites over Calgary, and the Toronto game still off the board, awaiting the status of Swag Kelly. He's in. Uh, I saw. Uh, it, it, for some reason, they're still not putting it up, which is interesting. I mean, and, and the Montreal game's up there. I guess maybe people don't believe that Cody might not play. Oh, sorry. Uh, Coach Dinwiddie said today he's trending upward, believes he will be starting Sunday against Ottawa. That's yeah. That's what I saw. <clears throat> they and then a good chance, Dave Naylor says, yeah. Indi- last week. Dave Naylor also says indications are he's going to start. Excellent. Well, it would be nice to get that line back up on the uh, the board. But we did do the lock shop earlier today and I got two things for you. We've got a partner parlay. Usually we do that for the Friday, Saturday, Sunday games, but well, we didn't know what was up with Toronto. We knew some people would want to get on the bombers. So we've got one for you today, starting with tonight's game. And we did hit it last week again at just about seven to one. We've hit two, uh, two of the last three weeks. And here's what we got for you today. Bombers minus 12 and a half riders plus five and a half in Montreal. And we were going back and forth. I personally was on the stamps. Dusty was on the Lions minus a five and a half, although he uh, gave me the benefit of the doubt last week and we won. So I'm returning the favor to him. Um, BC with VA back plus 660 for the lock shop partner parlay right now. Got to get in on it before kickoff tonight of the bomber game, but a nice little boost and hopefully we can make it three of the last four weeks. If you just want to focus on tonight's game, the guys asked me if I wanted to put together a little WST parlay for a bomber special for tonight's game, and I did exactly that. Uh, I'm feeling Kenny Lawler. I'm throwing Kenny Lawler over 74 and a half as my play of the day for on the cool bet socials. So we're going to lock in Kenny Lawler at 75 plus yards receiving. Uh, the over-under on Zach Caleros' receptions is 19 and a half. We're going to take the over on that, and we're going to take zero interceptions for Zach Caleros. We're going to pair that with Bombers minus 12 and a half. So a clean game from Zach, a big game from Kenny Lawler, a Bomber cover, plus 550 right now. WST exclusives. And by the way, if you do want just something else, maybe to uh, throw a sprinkle on, I love the Japanese tonight in the Women's World Cup going up against Sweden. It was actually plus 125 yesterday. It's plus 130 right now. Uh, I do have a future on Japan to win the entire thing. And I think there's value on the Netherlands as well. Either Netherlands or a draw. Um, Spain did not look good earlier in the tournament, and they got boat raced by the Japanese. Um, Netherlands tied the United States. They were right there. So I think Spain is overvalued. Love Japan, though. That is uh, that is the uh, is, is the play. Um, what do you think about Kenny Lawler tonight? Are you with me riding the yes. over? I think he's just having going to have some, some monster games. I, I'm going to have to get back in the DK. I forgot the last few times. Where are we at for that uh, this week? Yeah, we do have, if you want to play uh, CFL Fantasy, uh, my personal favorite game is on DraftKings. Uh Send us your username or just direct message us for the link to our, our private league. Uh, I did. I haven't had too much luck uh, the last couple of weeks, but Kenny Lawler has had really low price on there, I guess because he came back from suspension, and I think he was like 6500 and last week he was like 7000 Now they bumped him up to ten k. so Kenny Lawler a bit more expensive, and as you would expect, uh, some of the Bombers got pretty high salaries this week with them being such big favorites. Against Edmonton, I know Oliveira is probably going to be popular. Zach Caleros, popular pick this week with a lot of uncertainty around a lot of the other QBs, just like is Fajardo banged up, Chad Kelly banged up, Vernon Adams, I think he's coming back from injury too. 
but Eclairs seems like a very solid option uh, relative to the rest of the QBs. But and you know Kenny Law is popular, and some people like to play Waltarski. Uh, he hasn't scored in a couple games, but um, he's been it was a early you know red zone target, solid one for Zach Claris. So um, curious where the points are going to come from for the Bombers tonight. We're expecting a lot of them. Yeah, well, uh, looking forward to it. I guess eight o'clock start tonight, and uh, working on a uh, bit of a, a watch party for the game next Friday. Um, so stay tuned to Winnipeg Sports Talk on that. I think we might be heading over to uh, Hooters for a bit of a uh, extravaganza, but uh, we'll tell you a little bit more about that tomorrow when we break down tonight's game with the Elks and the Winnipeg Football Club. Um, big show tomorrow. Ken, Ken Weave returns. Um, looking forward to having Ken on the program and discussing... Well, we probably won't even touch the second line center, the Jets. I, I think we 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 might it's, we might. He's covered it all. Topics. He covered all the second line center. <laughs> yeah, we'll probably talk talk about the far game. But yeah, I don't think Ken has anything left to say about the Jets situation at center. <laughs> um, Mike McIntyre is going to join us as well. Remo and I will break down the Bomber game. Hacksaw will jump on. Of course, we'll have another marble race. By the way, shout out to Kirk Contois. For winning last week what a performance by kirk uh and uh of course in the meantime enjoy this game tonight bombers minus 12 and a half you know where i'm on kenny lawler as well big game for kenny we will talk about it all tomorrow wherever you're watching the game tonight i would suggest your local boston pizza enjoy it and uh, make sure to join us to kick off a weekend and uh, have a little fun on the marble track tomorrow on a friday edition of wst enjoy the game everyone oh my god oh! Shut it down! Let's go home! Thanks for tuning in to Winnipeg Sports Talk Daily. Make sure to subscribe on YouTube and your favorite podcast feed at winnipegsportstalk.com.